Okay, so I call the May 25th meeting of the school committee to order. Um, it's 7.04 for the purposes of our timestamp on the video. Um, so let me just do a quick walkthrough of our agenda for this evening, and then we will jump in. Um, before we do that, I do just want to thank uh, Millie and the team here at METCO for hosting us. Um, it's very exciting for us to be here uh, in Boston again uh, for the second year in a row, and hopefully the second of many years in a row. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us this evening as well. Um, so from an agenda perspective, we're going to start with public comment. So if anybody has a comment to make on anything that's not on the agenda, that would be the opportunity to do so. Um, we'll move into our consent agenda. We'll go through reports. Um, in the new business section, we're going to have uh, some comments from uh, and a presentation from Millie. Um, Mr. Martin is going to have a presentation on the Reading Metco program. Um, the Friends of Reading Metco are here to introduce their organization and some of the great work that they're doing. Um, we've got some of the board members from CPAC who are here to uh, introduce CPAC as well. And then um, our, the only item we'll vote on tonight, we do need to take a final vote on the 23-24 budget and capital plan now that the uh, budget's been allocated by town meeting. And then uh, finally, we'll just sort of review the process and timeline for the superintendent evaluation process, which will kick off tonight. So that's our agenda. Um, and as I said, we'll start with public comments. So if anybody wants to speak to anything that's not on the agenda, now would be the chance to do so. No? Okay, great. Um, so if we can move to the consent agenda. Carla, is there a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda. <clears throat> is there a second? Second. Seconded by Chuck. Uh, any discussion on the consent agenda? Nope. Okay, all in favor? All opposed? Four to zero. Um, I should have mentioned as well, um, two of our members are at the choir banquet tonight. They have kids who are featuring prominently in the choir banquet, so they, uh, they had to be there. Uh, but they do send their regards, and I think both were disappointed by this conflict in particular. So, um, Okay, so let's go to reports, and we will start with what I think will be the last report ever from Jada. Um, so as of last Thursday, our seniors have had our last day. So we are no longer at school. The prom was last night for seniors. And next Friday, we are having our graduation at the, it's going to be on the football field if any of you are coming. And I think we're all kind of excited looking back. We'll be doing our elementary school visits with their cap and gown. And I think it's kind of an exciting time for all of us. Fingers crossed for great weather next Friday. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so. Thank you, Jada. Thank you for uh, just everything you've done this year. As a student. Um, Dr. Hardy. No reports. No reports. Um, Dr. Milicheski. Yeah, I just want to follow up and just thank Jada, too. So it's been wonderful getting to know you this past year. And I just think has really raised the bar for what the engagement of a student representative on the, on the committee has been. I think that you've been really engaged throughout all the direct activity this year, but also been uh, really thoughtful and in all the different dialogues and conversation we had so a huge thank you to you and I'd also share for everyone out there Gina's also just one of our model students a star student athlete uh, does extremely well in the classroom multiple sports uh, model student and peer so I just think having not only your level of engagement in the committee but also how you carry yourself in the community I think is uh, has been wonderful to watch and wonderful to have you on the committee so thank, thank you, you. Um, I just have two quick updates around um, personnel matters. The first is that we did just hire a new RISE director. As you may know, uh, Joanne King was the interim director for the past year. Uh, just now hired Carrie Wilcox. Carrie Wilcox has been a special education teacher for over, a special uh, pre-K teacher for over 20 years in a couple of different districts, and then most recently has been a pre-K director, uh, director at the Bill Ricca Public School. So uh, we think obviously as someone who brings in a lot of pre-K knowledge and expertise, uh, strong background in special education, and also someone who has been a leader in a school. Uh, I think that's going to be a really good fit with our community. So very excited to welcome Carrie Wilcox. Uh, the other update of personnel is, we, uh, as you know, we are very disappointed to lose Susan Botan as our Director of Finance and Operations. Um, yeah, she's been awesome and amazing for our community in so many ways. We did just complete the first round of the search, and unfortunately, we did not. It did not end with a candidate that we moved for uh, with an offer. So we did just repost the position, uh, both as a one-year uh, interim position in case we can't find the long-term candidate, and then post it again just in case we do find someone uh, out there who is the long, the right fit long-term. So anyone here tonight or in the community who knows of any potential candidates, um, please let us know, and we will continue to keep the committee informed as we move that process forward. Great. Um, Chuck. So, uh, and I'll 
report for the policy committee. Tom and I <coughs> won't do as good a job. Uh, we, we met, I think it was May 9th, uh, and we had a, night, a meeting actually at, at Reading Memorial High School. We met with the students uh, regarding the facilities naming policy and listening. We also uh, approved amendments to po policy DIE, which is on audits, uh, and DK, which is on uh, payment procedures. I believe Tom will be bringing those to the committee uh, at our next meeting. And then we discussed uh, policy DJE, which is procurement, and then we just uh, we just had too many questions, and uh, a lot of it. So Tom is going to go back. So it was a pretty. It was a good, very good meeting. Uh, you know, obviously highlighted by meeting with the students. Nice. The uh, Simon's Way Exploratory Committee meets on Tuesday night, uh, and I just heard <coughs> from the chair that the board of selectmen. I think I mentioned in our last meeting, we were, the select board was considering expanding our scope. So. We're Chuck, on DIE and DK, did, um, did you pass some ed edits to those that we're going to review in the June 8th meeting? Is that the, that the subcommittee recommended yeah, edits? Tom's yeah. text to me was June 8th will be a yeah. very thorough policy. A lot of policies on June 8th, yeah. So everybody stay tuned for that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we'll sort of formally notice here that that will be a one meeting review for, yeah. for the updates yes. to those, for those two policies. So. Um, in addition to, I think, six or seven others that we have for prior meetings. So, um, uh, June 8th is going to be a big meeting. Um, anyway, okay, thank you, Chuck. Erin. Yeah. Um, um, so, C CPAC held a viewing of a documentary last week called Anxious Nation. Um, very hard to watch, but um, very, very powerful documentary around um, how many teens today are dealing with anxiety. Um, and thankfully, I felt like it ended a, a little bit on a hopeful note, but you know, it was, it was very powerful. I encourage people to check it out if you have a chance. Um, and Pear is gearing up for the big Juneteenth celebration on Saturday, June 24th. It's gonna be a really awesome event, so hopefully people can come partake in that. Thank you, and Carla. So the Killam Building Committee, so we have our Killam representative here, fourth grade representative. Um, <laughs> the Killam Building Committee met um, multiple times over the past couple of weeks. We, um, we had a request for services for um, OPMs for owners project managers for it. And we came back with six companies submitted bids we pared it down to four companies that we wanted to interview. And last week, um, we created a subcommittee because we can't, couldn't have a quorum. So four of us had, um, four of us including the town manager and including Joe Huggins, our, um, Joe Huggins, our, thank you, facility director. <laughs> um, we interviewed, we had four one-hour interviews with different companies. They were all really impressive. They, um, they brought multiple people with them. We pared it down to our first, second, and third choice. And on Monday, we presented to the large committee our number one choice, which was Turva. Um, they were really impressive. I think we, we were unanimous on our, and very strong with our first, first um, place company. They were really good. They were um, very dynamic. They worked really well together. They um, were really excited. The nice thing about them is that they're a smaller company and this would be a big opportunity for them. So we feel like we, could, we would have their attention and they would give it their all. Um, so we were really, really excited about that. So currently the town manager is entering into negotiations with them. 
and if all that happens, um, we'll, we'll get on the MSBA's board meeting for that type of approval. So we're really, really excited about this. Yep. So do they, <coughs> now that they're picked, do they hang around throughout the whole process or just this section of it? So they'll always be even after a general contract? They will be, so an owner's project manager is to represent the owner. So okay. they'll, they're here to protect the district, um, to make sure that we're getting the best product from the designers, from the contractors. Um, the thing, one of the things, um, they, were, they had six people in attendance and most of the companies had four to six people in attendance. And we got to interview the actual people who would be our go-to people for the design piece of it, for the construction piece of it. Um, they didn't fly people in from somewhere else in the country. <laughs> they, were, they were in front of us, they were really like excited um, this one guy was talking about ventilation, and he was excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was really, it was really good. We were really, really pleased with the process. Can you just repeat what changes we're looking at? What when we go into this MSBA process, we will have to look to see if we are going to um, add on to Kellum, or if we're going to replace Kellum. So we kind of have a guess as to what we think is going to happen. But we will, they will help us through that process to figure out um, what will be best for the town um, because we will be getting money from the Mass Building Association, but MSBA will be getting money from them, so we want to maximize the money that we're going to get from them. Okay. Good question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> she routinely asks the best questions. Ever, so. um, okay, thank you, Carla. I appreciate that. Um, I just have one update, which is actually on Tom's behalf as well. Um, so the Legal Council Selection Subcommittee, I think is the formal title, um, has narrowed down to four finalists. They are interviewing those four finalists on June 7th and 8th. Um, they'll then meet on June 15th to vote, um, presumably one finalist to, uh, to recommend to us. And so I expect that that'll be on our June 22nd um, agenda for us to appoint a new um, Special Education Council for the school committee. So, okay. Um, so with that, um, I think we're going to move on to new business and we'll turn it over to Millie. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. I'm going to say good afternoon because <laughs> I just got in. I was at home today working remotely until this meeting. So good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Well, good. So it's so nice to have um, the districts come and visit us right here in our, in our neighborhood. I know that last year or I think it was a year ago, right? I think that's one of the first, first visitors that we had after we cut the ribbon in this building, when Curtis planned the uh, tour um, with a bus full of people that came over, and it was a really nice treat to actually start our district tours, um, you know, in our new home with Reading. And, you know, really happy to have you guys here again, having an official meeting. Um, that this is what we want all of our districts to be able to do, to ensure that we have one or two times a year where we're here in this community, you know, also sharing back the love back and forth so that all of us are, you know, are, are taking turns uh, being with each other. Um, I'm gonna, um, how much time do I have first? You gotta tell me, you know how, you know me, so you gotta tell me time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, sure. But just, just give me yeah. buffers, you know? I'll give you buffers, I mean. Um, but tell me what's the ideal. Ideal so, so is probably good. probably twenty is probably twenty to twenty five is the ideal. Well, so, so, what, oh. so what were you planning for? What, what were you planning for? Twenty five minutes to an hour. So thirty, 30 to forty five. Thirty to forty five. So, okay, about thirty to forty five. All right. Okay, so thirty to forty. So thirty to forty. Yeah. All right. Okay. So if it gets too boring, we'll stop. It's not gonna be boring. Take pictures. Not Everybody not knows how I am. I like to take pictures. Okay. So at some point during this whole thing, we need to take pictures, guys, and we gotta figure it out. Okay. Yes. Um, because it was like an hour longer than it was on the agenda. Okay. Yeah, they sometimes run long. <laughs> so, well, we'll try to make this part at least enriching, exciting, new information, and inspiring, okay? Um, and I will try to swift through it as much as I possibly can. But we do have to take a break in between my exhibit um, explanation and the PowerPoint to at least take a photo. Because you guys have to be in my newsletter next week, if you guys know the theme. <laughs> right, so, so for those of you that are sitting co too close to the TV, if you cannot see, feel free to move over to like the most, like the seats that are in the corner. These two are available here. These last two 
if you want to move over, because I think your neck is going to hurt a little bit. If you, you want to move over here, if you want that's available, okay. Um, and let me know if there's a temperature issue. We can put up the AC if needed. There's a bathroom right in outside the door next to the elevator. There's two bathrooms right up the stairs, and after you leave, there will be some swag bag with some goodies for you to take home, a nice little Neko bag with swag, okay? So some logistics. All right. Okay. So again, my name is Millie Abraham Thomas. Um, Oh my God. My kids are Thomas Harbaugh. So today I was making a lot of appointments and I forget my own name. Um, okay. So I am the uh, president and CEO here at the Meco headquarters. I've been here for five years. So got to see the induction of your two leaders here. Um, so that's been a real treat. I'm um, seeing Tom and, and, and Curtis come on board. Um, and also, I'm a Meco parent, and I'm a Meco parent in Brookline. I started in kindergarten, so way before I got this job, and my daughter is actually in high school right now. So I'd like to give that little bit of a context to know that I transitioned from a parent role to this role, so there's a lot of personal stories there. All right, how many of you guys feel like you know the MECO program? Like that you know it really well, that you know how it works, how it's funded, how it started? <laughs> How many of you guys think so? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Tell me tell me a little bit. I know it was started back in the 60s. Okay. Um, Correct. It <laughs> <laughs> started, started back in the 60s um, in response to um, some inequalities with the Boston Public Schools and to give, at that time, um, black students an opportunity um, for an integration program and also give white students an opportunity to um, be black students and not just sit next to them, but it's a, a point of learning together, uh, going to you know um, resource schools, but also the opportunity to get to know each other and as a as a partnership. Okay, what do you do? What's your relationship to writing? Because that was all correct. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm Reginald Nichols. Uh, folks call me Reggie. I am a, a resident of, of of Reading. I'm a former resident of, of Boston. Um, raised in Mattapan um, mm -hmm. and went to Boston Public Schools during the 1970s. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of these pictures yeah. here bring back memories. Yeah. Some happy, no, some not so happy. Right. But right. Also, I'm also the big piece. I'm also part of Friends of Friends of Reading awesome. and committed to to the mission. Well, thank you. This is another. This is an example of also integration. Like you say, when you have someone that grew up in the city and then you know, was able to eventually integrate, you know, a suburban community. So this, I'm really happy to hear that, but you got it all right. I have like, see, you just gave five, five minutes of my speech right there. Yeah, what about you? Awesome, right? Keeping us on track. What, what do you, tell me something different that he didn't say. Uh, I, I can go to the, fast forward to the present. Okay. Is that a, a that's a interesting, that cause yes, because that's me, so let me see. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? There are 32 school districts in Massachusetts. 33 now. Yes. They just added one. <laughs> uh, that are, you know, that are part of the MECO program and something like more than 3,000 students. Yes. All right. Correct as well. And what is your relationship to Reading? I'm a Reading parent. I have three daughters in the schools of Reading and I'm also part of Friends of Reading MECO. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. coming here. Something else that's new that someone didn't mention. Does anybody know how it was funded? Is there money mm -hmm. attached to this? Mm -hmm. Does money come with the program? Yes. Yeah. Maybe yes. some state funding. State funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know you're working hard to get additional funding through other sources. Yes. Philanthropy and other places. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Any, anything else that's not said? I want to mm -hmm. say, I, I, I have a recollection of it being something about uh, just a few towns together and it being sort of a... Um, what is it? A, a, what is the CO? Council or um, council? Yeah, the CO is council. Yeah. Council, and so that it, it it's really like a, a a region kind of together, right? Instead of, and it, it started off with that vision, and now it's, it's individual towns signing on. Something about that. Am I right, or am I? Well, I mean, it is the much that so Metco every letter doesn't mean something, which right. is kind of interesting. I really want to change the logo to be like just capital M, capital C, because it's a metropolitan council. Mm -hmm. That's where Metco ends. Then everything else is added for educational opportunity. Uh -huh. So that that's like the whole name of Mecca. That's what Mecca stands for. But it started off with like the great the, the Greater Boston. So the Boston yeah. and then everything like close by ish. Yeah. 
This was the national landscape in which the METCO program was birthed, a nation ranked with racism, full of misguided intention, and ready to burst. In the early 60s, Boston parents were becoming increasingly frustrated with inadequate educational facilities in comparison to their white counterparts across the city. I have 42 students, 36 seats, we didn't have new crayons, we had a box of old number crayons. Pencils had to be collected at the end of the day so you would have enough for the children for the next day. There was no encouragement from anybody. I call it complete official neglect. Many of the Negro parents believe that a predominantly Negro school is inferior per se, but we in, here in Boston do not believe that premise. The Racial Imbalance Act of 1965 made the segregation of public schools illegal in Massachusetts. But Boston's all-white school committee refused to comply. If the implementation of the racial imbalance law is allowed to happen in the city of Boston, then we should be on the streets marching to save our city. Black Boston parents led protests, rallies, and direct confrontations with officials. They organized boycotts, community schools, and even their own busing program within the city called Operation Exodus. They were determined to get their children the educational opportunities they deserved. Meanwhile, some families in the suburbs began to see the need for their children to integrate with children of color. Some of these towns recognize the racial disparities in the country, so do open their schools up to students from Roxbury, Dorchester, students of color. So this is really the beginning of METCO. METCO has grown to become the nation's largest voluntary school desegregation program. Each year, the state of Massachusetts provides the funding for about 3,000 Boston students from racially segregated neighborhoods to enroll in suburban schools that are racially isolated. METCO is basically a way to prepare kids for the real world. And the real world isn't all white and all black and all male and all female. It's everybody working together, together to make this world a better place when you leave it. When people are educated in the same classroom, they break down their own stereotypes of one another and they give each other an opportunity. And that is what the MEC program does. It builds friendships and it actually breaks down racial barriers. This is a wonderful opportunity for our children to experience the diversity that exists in the world. Now, you can give lectures and read books about diversity but it's much better if you actually experience it. Whenever you can have diversity of thought in your community, um, that's important. When Boston resident students have the opportunity to integrate a school district seemingly devoid of color, it does bring up other issues. METCO students often find themselves in classes where they are the only students of color. There's a certain level of trust that parents have to have with a district, with METCO staff, with educators, to put your five-year-old on a school bus in the morning to leave their community to go be educated by folks that they're going to get to know, but maybe not folks that are their neighbors that would have been at their neighborhood school. The challenge is that I don't often get to see people that look like me around here. And for better or for worse, that affects how I function. I've learned a lot of patience I also learned how to just navigate through the world, it, which is a really good skill to have, especially going forward in the future. Things have happened to students that involve race and that involve uh, who one is or, or what they look like. 
I think what I'm proud of is that we're willing to say, wait a minute, let's pause, let's reflect on what happened and learn from it and grow from it. We are part of a grassroots movement then and a grassroots movement now, but now the grassroots movement is about changing people's minds and mentalities. I want our students to feel that they've learned about different people, they've learned deeply about themselves, and they now believe that they can impact the world in a very positive way. And those are the ambassadors who will make um, America what it can be. Shore, further than you guys, Marblehead, Swamp Scott, it's like really, really up there. And then also, but in the South Shore, we also have Hingham Baltimore. and Sitche, Sitchu, yeah, but Baltimore is not as bad as those other ones. And maybe this isn't the right point of this to ask, but I'm just, as I, I think about Metco in Boston, what, what about Springfield and those? Is there any movement to? build programs in those parts of the state? So that's a very interesting question because we actually have a medical program in Springfield. You do? Right? We actually do, but guess what? I know zero about it. <laughs> so don't ask me more questions. It's on my, no, I'm saying it's on my to-do list. And the reason why I don't know much about it is because that one is run completely different. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. I don't even think it's 100 students. They get the same funding that I advocate for, they get it, but it's run through their school department. It's run through the actual like school system of Springfield uh, Public Schools. You know, not like here that we don't run through Boston Public Schools, we run through this office. But um, yeah, there's been a disconnect there that's on my to-do list to figure that out is because they don't have enough profit, they don't have um, the same setup. It's just like their school system that's one of your schools that you can select to go, and it's tiny. But one of the goals that I have, because you know, the population here in Boston is changing and it's not as, People, much people of color as it used to be, you know, one of the visions is do we, can we reduce the commute and go to cities like Lawrence for the North Shore, cities like Brockton and Randall for the South Shore. So that's gonna be part of my strategic plan that we're developing right now and seeing how we reduce the commute, find more diversity in other areas so that we're not exhausting this community already because we have a lot of charter schools that have opened up. We have exam schools here, pilot schools. So when the MECO program started, there was nothing. It was it was Boston Public Schools in Mecco. That was your only choice. Now there's a lot of choices here. Good question. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Are those the only two? Springfield? So in, in this office, yeah. Yeah, those are yeah that's the only two. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's other two uh, programs like us in Connecticut and New York. I actually meet with them every month just for partnership building that they also are run differently. They don't run through a nonprofit either. So there's a lot of bureaucracy. They run through the State Department and through the school system. And the one in New York is literally run by superintendents. And they just have a council of the board and they just like exchange students um, in upstate New York. And the other day they were even thinking about taking the busing away, which doesn't even make any sense. And then in Connecticut, as part of their school choice program, um, as part of, they have a lot of magnet schools there too. And then, and then their program um, that's called Urban Suburban is also part of it. But it's also run through the school department. So we're the only ones with this unique style of like grassroots led, state funded, but not the state is not the one like placing students, your money just goes to them for them to just oversee it because it's public dollars. Then it comes to us for us to do whatever we need to do with it and that has a non-profit in, in the middle of it all. Any other questions? You up? Oh, well, yes. What adaptations have happened to the program over time? So like, I know a little bit about the current format, but what have we kind of improved on since the 1960s? Mm -hmm. Amazing question. <laughs> all right, I call that the 2.0 discussion that I'm gonna have a little bit later. So um, 
I don't know. I can't speak to you of how much more happened before my time. I think what happened is that we continue to exist and continue to transport our students back and forth. I think we're in this new phase after 2020, after George Floyd, where we're trying to do something deeper now and more intentional. And I think the districts are actually have a deeper commitment to doing anti-racism work, but understanding that it's not just to benefit black and brown students, but to benefit all students when you when you when you raise compassionate, open-minded, you know, human 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 beings for the future. But you know, I can tell you later what I'm doing. But um, you'll see over here is that the last time we had an influx of districts was in 1968. And then after that, only three, four more communities came on board, and the last one was 1977. So there's been no shift in increasing our MECO program since the 70s. Um, and in terms of how it's run, because every school district receives the funds and does whatever they want, we haven't necessarily all done everything the same way. But now, we are actually working together to develop a blueprint of best practices. We have a consultant that's actually talking to every single community right now and gathering um, a book of best practices for us and doing a MECO assessment. We've never done that in the history of the MECO program, so we're gonna have that for the first time this fall, and it will show us our opportunities for collaboration, our areas where we can make improvement, and it will allow us every single year to assess how we can do better. I'm sorry, I have one more question. Yeah, no one of the uh, members of the subcommittee that I have of students is in the MECO program, our sophomore representative. Mm -hmm. And she often talks about kind of like the, not necessarily achievement, but like placement gap that starts to happen in middle school of when we separate into math classes by like mm -hmm. ranking and in high school when you're taking honors, AP classes, mm -hmm. that MECO students tend to be taking regular and honors classes and kind of aren't necessarily pushed into the AP and into the honors track. That is 100% correct. Mm -hmm. And that data actually proves it. Are you sure that you're just a senior in high school? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going next year? I'm going to American University to study poli science while you're coming. Oh, poli science. Oh, very good. So yes, um, you are absolutely correct. I actually just met with them. We have a researcher right now that's researching the MECO program. It is the largest research in the history of the MECO program. It's a professor of economics at Tufts University. And she's been researching this for five years. She has complete access to all of the data in the state because she has an agreement with them because it has never been done to this uh, level before. She has access to the Department of Labor data of how much our people are making after they graduate. She has marriage records if people are married interracially. She has what kind of colleges people are going into. She has their test scores. That's gonna be one of my next meetings, by the way. I'm preparing that data with her to report it back out to the community. So that data does show that our students are not at the same level taking AP classes. And that is a clear gap that we have seen. We just got that presentation just last week. And we're actually trying to use it to then talk about what, how do we use this data to ensure that this is not happening. But I have to ensure that the districts know this and they see it with numbers so that they can have an intentional approach that they're going to do something about it. Like, for example, there's some districts, I can tell you, like, for example, in Brooklyn, because that's my district. In Brooklyn, they have this, pro this program called the Calculus Project. So they intentionally grab you in seventh grade and begin to give you math in preparation with mentors and math teachers, some of programming. And then when you go to the school, they like automatically ensure that you're going to honors right away. And then you get a math coach throughout the entire year checking up on you. And they have math uh, calculus project office hours. And then they uh, and then they ensure that you don't fall behind. Mm -hmm. So you know that's like, my daughter's in all of that because she's a freshman right now. So we we're like actually walking that track right now. We have a similar program in seventh grade. We have like the seventh eighth grade math that you take in seventh grade, and then you take mm -hmm. honors algebra one in eighth grade. Oh, that's, I believe how it's still run at Parker and Coolidge. And if you're not on that track, unless you double up in math, you won't reach calculus by the time you graduate. So it's, if students don't reach that track early, it's kind of hard to get back on. Right, right. And I think this is something that our educators need to know. I mean, our teachers have to have intentional training and intentional direction from the leader saying like, we need to, we need to start looking at our students of color, residents or non-residents, right? And figuring out how we just automatically put them there and making assumptions, because that is a stereotype, that is a bias that's happening, that people just don't get that opportunity. What some districts are doing is that they're automatically putting our students of color in honors and just in providing support and then seeing if it doesn't work versus like trying to prove that you can actually belong there. But um, 
wow, your questions start deep. See, I need more time because that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was going to say, I beg to differ. The seventh and eighth grade math is quite different than what. <coughs> that's how it was when I was she's there. She's talking either. about because um, you test into it, and if you don't, if you don't, if they don't feel that you're equivalent enough, they don't put you in it, and. It's not encouraged. I'm going to speak only on my son, my behalf, my family's behalf. Um, my son wanted to do honors. He's good at math and so forth, and it was not encouraged. I was and the top student in my class, and I was told not to take it. Right, but I'm saying, teacher, so, so but I'm saying, and so it's not, but it's not encouraged for you to take it because you're a student of color. So they don't look at it as you can be successful in it. I think the program she's talking about is they go out and pick you and say, you know, we're going to help you be successful. There's a difference in me motivating you and helping you and working with you to be successful than me putting you somewhere and expecting failure. Because once you fail, it's so much harder for you to, to be willing to climb back up on that ladder. So I think there's the, the complete difference. But I want to I wanna ask you a question. You just said you were the top student and you didn't get into didn't get encouraged to take that class. What happened? So her uh, mother encouraged her. <laughs> her mother forced her to right, continue. Her mother, her mother, her mother, her mother I was going to school. take it anyway, but part, so part of the because they need to listen to these gaps so we can improve. It's not to shame anybody. I always tell people we just got to listen to it so we can make better choices. That's all. This is how it was when I was in sixth grade. Is mm -hmm. you take a test at the second semester in sixth grade, you have a recommendation from your sixth grade math teacher and your MCAS scores and all of that goes to the other to like kind of make an assessment yeah. about whether you should take yeah. about what of the three different math classes you should take in some degree. And there's a regular, there's an honors, and then there's the honors seven eight. Yeah. And I was I believe the only student of color. There might have been there might have been one other, but I was definitely the only <clears throat> black student. And I was like specifically told by my math teacher that she didn't think I should be in it, even though I had the highest MCAS score and the highest test score on the like placement exam. Did you ask her why? I think I did, but I don't remember the okay, conversation. That's fine. But you see, we need to hear this. Sure. This is exactly, that's why I said to you it's 100% true what you said. So I was the mother these, pushing. These are personal I, stories, and then I got data to back it up. I was so I'm like you. I was the person. I was the mother pushing and being told, "Well, we don't want to discourage him if he fails." And I was like, "Well, you can't do that until you know." And I'm not. And I kept pushing, and so that's yep. And I will say she's an APBC cat. So I mean, she obviously whether she fails at some point, I think everyone fails at some point. You know. She has made it this far, and she got one wrong on the SATs and that. So I mean, she definitely is, you know. Wow. The same thing also happens in eighth grade. But I imagine if your mother wouldn't have pushed, this is what happens. Oh, I was taking it whether she wanted to. <laughs> 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 but in eighth grade, That's your child. Yes. Um, Thank you. <laughs> just even like talking about stereotypes, there was me and another student in the same class. We had pretty similar grades. I wanted, we both wanted to take all honors classes freshman year. I wasn't even going to a school, so I didn't really care that much. But I was like, asking to be put in all honors, and my teachers told me I, they didn't think I could handle it. Mm -hmm. Or like, they thought it would be too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then an Indian student in my class was told to take mm -hmm. a class. Mm -hmm. Okay, can, yeah. I, can I ask a Very question, common. a follow-up for question mm -hmm. for that? Because my, my kids have been in Reading a long time, they've been through that. Is it, Maybe this is from the school district side. Is there a set number of slots in the AP courses? Mm -hmm. Or is it what they qualify for? Is there is there room for everyone? Or is there just a number cut off? There, so it kind of depends on the class. In my experience, it kind of depends on the class. Like, they, your class recommendations will never be based off of that. But like, if you can't fit it into your schedule, that may be a problem of like, if you want to take two AP sciences, that's three periods a day because they're double blocks. And sometimes it can be kind of hard to fit it in like schedule-wise and 
the sciences are kind of limited because of like OSHA regulations based on lab availability. So that's the only so place. So it is it kind of blocked off. I think the school committee, no, uh, Carla was going to say something, and she was saying, no, there is no limit. I saw her head oh, go like this. So, so <laughs> many of us on the school committee are we're motivated to be on the school committee because of a lot of the issues that you're talking about. Um, a, a student is never going to be, um, if the student should be in an AP class, they're going to be in an AP class. Um, right? I mean, it's, it, it, but a lot of Space-wise. Space, space, space would not space be the reason. Space. Yeah. So that's the yeah. question exactly. Yes. Space and issues. Yes. Right. The answer is no, yeah. right? right? You will always find the space if the, if the students yeah. are sent to that class. That's not to diminish whether there are okay. teachers making bad decisions about right. you know yeah. where students should be placed, but space-wise would not be a So a class size that's stopped at 22 <laughs> and you have 24, you're going to have another available uh, double section. section. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or they would do Oh yeah, it's got yeah. higher levels. It's got, it, it'll, it'll get up there, but yeah. Oh, sure. I, just, I'm sorry, I, 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 but I want to couple Listen, things. I, can, I am here for you the whole night. <laughs> 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 this should all be about so, Beco and good. improvements. This today should be about it. all of this. And Jada, thanks for getting the conversation going too. So a couple things on the, the math conversation. You're both all exactly right. So this is something our district's looking at now is currently there is a, a, uh, seven, a seven eight, uh, math, 7-8 math, and if you are not in 7-8 math, which is dictated by a placement test in sixth grade, it is a really difficult to make your way up to calculus without either doubling up, so taking two maths, like during a semester uh, or during a year, or taking summer coursework too. So one of the things that we're trying to figure out right now is how do we make sure that uh, all students, regardless of whether you take seven or eight math, have a clear path to whatever math you want, whether that's calculus, statistics, or something else. And right now, there's not a there's not a clear path, um, and that's a challenge for us. And a lot of our students, just we know, developmentally aren't ready for seven or eight math yet. They mm -hmm. could thrive, and those are our students who will be our top students in calculus. Just because a student necessarily isn't developmentally ready for that math in seventh grade doesn't mean that barrier, a sixth grade placement test, shouldn't dictate where they go. So that's something I think our committee, I think, has really pushed me, and I think our team's really looking at. And what do we do there? Now, to take it a step further, we also recognize that when we look at who's in our advanced placement classes, it's predominantly white students. Um, and when you look at it, if you look across you know, race, socioeconomic status, disability status, um, English learner status, our, our classes are not extremely diverse when we get to our AP levels. And I think like the example that, you know, Millie, you give of, of Brooklyn is we need to do more to ensure that we open doors for all of our students so that our top level classes, our AP classes, reflect the diversity of our district, and right now they, they don't. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, a metric you can look at, like on Desi's website, that says, like, you know, broken down by race, by socioeconomic status, of what percentage of students are taking advanced coursework. And you can see from there that Reading, we have a lot of work to do. So I just, all the people who have raised comments, I, <coughs> we totally agree with and think that there's a, a lot of room to grow for us. And I think just back to, to comment on the AP numbers. A, the only thing, the spots where there's barriers right now is math. If kids haven't taken the prereq math classes, they just won't be ready to take those. So I think that's a barrier. But in all the other content areas, if a student wants to take AP and they can fit it in their schedule, we create, we open those doors for them. Uh, environment, and, and some of them have become really popular that we're having to figure out, like how do we staff them? Like right now, environmental science has become really popular. But for the most part, for students who want to take APs outside of scheduling barriers, they're able to take APs. So um, I think you know there, there's something to be said about these best practices too. This is exactly what we're doing. Like right now, these assessments that we're doing is for that purpose. If I'm who's doing what and how can we help each other, meet with one another, replicate those things. For example, I did. Um, I was here with the school committee the other day with Lincoln Sudbury, and uh, they just opened up something new um, called Cafe Mathematica. And every single medical student arrives at a certain time, like in early in the morning, because the bus arrives and they go straight to cafe, all with math and math teachers. And it's super fun, food, snacks, math teachers all around, super casual cafe, you know, cafe style. So that's like their way, because that's what you were saying, it has to be intentional. In my district, I can tell you that I was trying to get somebody, without saying who it is, I was trying to get somebody out of a, in a, in a, an honors class, because it was a little bit challenging. And the teacher went after me and said, don't do it. 
right? Like, <laughs> if she gets out of this, it's going to be hard for her to get back on this track for AP. And the teacher, like, encouraged me, like, in three different occasions not to give up on it and not to come out of it. And I was the one that I thought, you know, maybe this is too much right now because of what I'm seeing. And, um, and they actually said, let's keep at it, let's keep at it. We can do this, this next year, but let's not give up because I don't want her to lose her, her track. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some intentional, there has to be teaching um, professional development around these gaps, you know, mm -hmm. because again, the teachers have to be able to be the ones to say, you can do it, I'm gonna recommend you for that. But it also mm -hmm. what preparation is being done in between, if you do acknowledge that there are gaps and the test scores are saying it, you know, what can we do to prepare the students and I'm not saying just students of color either, just students. Students that are not on track, how do we prepare them to stay on track, you know? But that's all how you allocate resources, how you allocate your teaching, your rooms, your money. But all of that is doable. Any other questions, please? <laughs> I'll think of some. Okay. <laughs> all right. this, is, this is how it's really important. I'm so glad that you guys have a youth rep there because really, um, in a youth rep of color because this is how you miss opportunities, you know, if you don't have somebody at the table. Thank you, Jada. All right, so I'm gonna probably, um, Mr. Sean. Keep going. Okay, I'm gonna really skim through this, but I think a lot of it is coming up now in conversations. If, you know, if I'm going too fast, just tell me, Millie, that's interesting, say a little bit more. Um, I, I'm not gonna get offended, okay? So just, but I am gonna probably skim through it, because I do want to tell you a little bit about all of this because when I have people here, this is like my pride and joy is this room. This is something that I always wanted, that I dreamed about when I got this job, because as a mother, I didn't know the program had historic relevance. I didn't know that it was a civil rights movement, that it was parents fighting for equity. I didn't know that there was an opportunity to fulfill a promise from the 60s that still today we have not achieved. Mm -hmm. And when I found that out, you know, I, I, and we are a historical program, we live in Northeastern University. There's an archive there, you find almost 60 years worth of information on the MECO program. Mm. So when I found that out, I had um, our students um, with my communications um, director uh, have an internship here. It was called Hacking the Archives. Mm. And they spent the whole summer hacking the research, reading, doing documentaries, going to Northeastern. We also have some, some of our information at Harvard and some at UMass, other uh, archives. And then we developed this and then I said, we developed that back in the day to do like a um, to do like a, a presentation and a video because I didn't I had an old building when I got this job and then I said if I ever have a new space and I can have one dedicated area just to exhibit the history of Mecco I want to do it and then when I got this space we only had upstairs and then after the place was almost done ready to cut the ribbon the landlord calls me Milk's, her office is right here completely different this was an office with a conference room a desk over there gloomy. And then she said, Millie, I'm gonna move out of here. Do you want the first floor? And I'm like, yeah, I want it. <laughs> I was like, and the spiral staircase only goes upstairs. You can't have anybody else come here. This is connected. Mm -hmm. And then that's when we hurried up and got all of this and then created this exhibit. So this is really like a dream come true. And I do this presentation, I don't know how many times a week. And yesterday I did it and I cried. Mm -hmm. and every time I do this, seriously. If I had people from New York were here yesterday to do a podcast on the backlash against um, um, desegregation and they came to do a documentary with, with me talking about this and I just like choked up in the middle of it I don't know why mm -hmm. I was like but I do that all the time so be aware <laughs> okay all right so really quickly I'm not gonna say things that I know you already know but this is where we are located and then the numbers tell you where we are in terms of how many students are enrolled in these communities and it tells you when everybody joined so I already said a little bit about that and the video said it as well again stop me if you want this basically says right here um, that we st were started by parents, which is what I love about the MECO program, that it was a parent-led initiative. There was no government intervention, and this is why it's still existing, because there was no opposition. People wanted it. And it's really to address two things, like Reggie said, racial segregation and racial isolation. It was not a one-way street. People came together because it, fit, it, 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 um, it filled a need for both parties. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so the promise, right, the, the, the promise in the 1960s is that those two things will okay. no longer exist, right? <coughs> like both places will be integrated. Well, that, that, that would right? be, well, that would solve some sort of us. There would be a, 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 a some sort of a solution in the meantime. But that's what is that like? So impossible. Like, it, are there are there are are there other movements happening to try to? make it so that it's not required, you know, right. you know what I mean? And 
all of this stems from housing segregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Literally, that is the answer to all of this. Mm -hmm. And the first panel that, that you cannot see talks about redlining. Mm -hmm. And it talks about laws that were written in the bank saying, if you are black, do not let them lease, move, see a house, get a loan, any of that. So at the end of the day, as long as the housing inequities mm -hmm. exist, and that there is no, that's why I was so happy that Reggie, you know, Reggie's story, he was a man of pain and now he was able to move there. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a couple of those, um, you know, that started here and are there now, but it's like, it's not easy. Yeah. There's like systems, there's systemic racism in place that's keeping people from right. accessing those things. Yeah. You know, and we're still recovering, you know, particularly black families from all of the poverty that they were left in when the white flight happened, everybody left, communities were mm -hmm. impoverished, there was lack of like, you couldn't go to school in certain places, mm -hmm. you couldn't get educated in mm -hmm. certain places. Right. So I mean, that's like just centuries and decades of discrimination. I know, mm -hmm. and like, I get that, but mm -hmm. just on like a naive idealist level, mm -hmm. it's like, well, why? <laughs> yeah. You know, when it's, uh, you, you wish that that were what That that was not the case, you know? You know, as opposed to, <clears throat> But, I, but this is why I get yeah. motivated about MECO, because mm -hmm. at least MECO is doing exactly. something right. You know, exactly. in the meantime, like, people always tell me the same, like, the similar things, like, well, why are you taking kids out of Boston? Why don't we fix our schools here? Well, the problem is that it's deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not even about fixing the schools. You fix the schools here in Boston, there are 98% people of color now, because everybody left. Mm -hmm. when, that, when that ruling came out in 1974, that you must integrate Boston public schools, all the white families left. Mm -hmm. So then everybody stayed behind. So now, so if, you know what's so funny about Boston? Because my husband is an educator here, so he's, in a, he's, he, he's a principal at a high school, and we always talk about this. We take students of color from Mattapan, and we bus them to literally Charlestown for the same exact demographic. They spend an hour in a bus in the city of Boston mm -hmm. to literally see the same exact classroom, same curriculum, mm -hmm. and same exact demographic. I still don't understand how Boston hasn't figured out, like, stop the busing already, it doesn't even make sense. That, I mean, obviously this is like a naive thing, I don't know why it hasn't been done, but I think like you, like, you know, it doesn't make sense because my, we're literally moving the same exact ethnic background, the same exact demographics of students, mm -hmm. just across town so that we can say we're into because we're still trying to do that, mm -hmm. but there's no integration left, the white families right. left. Right. The only white families left here in Boston Latin school. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I grew, up in, I grew up in Worcester, and when you, when you walk in my high school, there were all the flats and all the diversity. So when we were looking to buy a house, it was just shocking to me that we could not find a community that like, we could afford a house, that we felt, you know, that we wanted to move to, but also with diversity. It was just, like, maddening to me. Um, anyway, so I, I don't my know kids' what. lives are enriched by having um, the Boston resident families there, so I, I'm, I'm very grateful for it. And thank you for saying that. That's exactly yeah. what I appreciate when I hear a suburban white family say that you're not sitting there doing a favor to anybody. Exactly. You are being right. rich by it. And that's when we really get it when people say that. Yeah. But yeah, well, there's a, I mean, there's just, we're doing I, I this, know. you know what I mean? I know, it sounds idealistic. I, mean, I, I know. don't know history. Like, but I for now, it's so frustrating. MECO is part of the solution. It's not yeah. the solution. Right. It is also small numbers, but it is a solution. We are purposely existing for the purpose of integration mm -hmm. and you know there's a quote that I have there that when people tell me like okay why do we need the MECO program <clears throat> and I'm always talking about the racial integration aspect of it and I said well did racism go away because last time I checked we're still here right. so as long as racism exists there's still a need for MECO because if we see MECO as what it was intended to be to integrate and expose back and forth and everybody benefits then there's still the need for it because if we just focus on the educational aspect of it, we're gonna lose our significance. Because if we talk about, you know, we just wanna go to school, I mean, we, MECO exists because great, giving a great academic experience for students of color. Yes, we check that box off. You guys are amazing academics. That is 100% true. But the minute we start opening up more charter schools here, more pilot schools, the exam schools just went through a whole revamp to let more students of color in because it was still, like you couldn't even get in. You live in the city of Boston and you can't even get into the number one school in the state, you know, because it's already it's already rigged. People are studying and studying tutors. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. move in here have double houses just to go to yeah. BLS. Oh it's no, no. There's a whole there's a whole community. If you guys haven't heard, there's a whole community mm -hmm. around Boston Line School, yeah. a whole community that does it, and, it's, and like you can see all the kids Boston go from one school really. to the other with the same tutors, with the same preparation, yeah. and then our students can't get in. So even there, we can't even have access to that. <coughs> yeah, Jada. I was just wondering, like, do you only, like, kind of serve
service students who are like black or are there are you working more with like a wider range of like non-white demographics yes the wider range so back in the day when this started it was only mostly black because in the 70s that was the population that was in this country so in this country but in this community you know this city um, then after that, you know, immigration started to happen. As you know, the, um, the, the, the population for Latinos is growing significantly. Mm -hmm. So now it's almost even with the black and Latinos in terms of who we refer out to the districts. Um, and then um, we look at any diversity, any diversity. And the whole goal is to represent the city of Boston's current diversity into the suburbs. So if the diversity here is changing, then that should be also what you're gonna be getting sent to your districts because we have to stay you know, true to to the times. But you said something interesting about when you said that your Indian friend or classmate was being recommended. I want to just say a comment about that, and I'm not, you know, flashing on any group or anything, but just talking reality. That uh, some, in some communities, when I do this presentation, they will tell me, you know, what well, our community is diverse enough. We don't think we need Michael because you know, there's haters. We got some haters mm -hmm. that don't think we're needed. But you know what the diversity is? Completely Indian and mm -hmm. Asian. Like mm -hmm. seriously, I think you guys know right around your community, like right a few of those towns next next door, <clears throat> a high Indian population, a high Asian population. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not it's not the urban diversity that's being discriminated. Mm -hmm. That's the one that's being said, okay, come in, you're smart. You see what I'm saying? There's different stereotypes. Yeah, there's different stereotypes. There's different stereotypes for sure. One is like you're super smart. I want the kid in my class. The other one is like, mm, this is gonna be trouble. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to represent that urban diversity, the one, because again, if we're trying to feed and trying to at least tackle some of the racism in this country, right? What do you see in the news? Is Black Lives Matter? Is black people being shot and being kept from certain things? It is Latinos not being able to cross the border. It's, it's, it's like walls being built and separating kids from their families. That's what's happening in this country. That's the racial crisis, not the other things, you know, the other groups. So that's why, but Mecco, it feel, feels a need that nobody else is feeling. So it's not all diversity, it's the diversity that is being historically discriminated against. And that has, that has historically been denied access. Does that make sense? <coughs> all right, so here I just chose, oh my God, Sean, I am so. It's hard It's questions. It's yeah, I have to tell questions. people that when they do a school committee here in Boston, she just be about this presentation and nothing else on the agenda, and the MECO agenda, the MECO director, because I'm telling you, once you're here, you got to hear it all. So this is um, here, it tells you, like, this is all our 33 communities summarized demographically to show you the segregation, or the, I mean, the racial isolation. Obviously, this is decent because that's 33 towns together summarizing, so it says 60%. It's why not too bad. But that is not your community. That's yeah, your community is 87 percent, you know, white. So you should. Uh, this oh, shows how, how much um, a <laughs> <second> <laughs> program <laughs> is needed or can be contributed. So, so let me continue to tell you here. So right now you have 101 students in your program. Um, we are state funded, so every single student that gets enrolled in your community gets eight thousand. Yeah, I know you're gonna be shocked about something because you haven't seen this, um, Curtis. Yeah, the one million. You're kind of shocked that you're looking at the one million, right? No, I didn't even realize it said oh, Reading. It was the, it was to our district. Yeah, so oh, yeah, no, this is Reading. Yeah, 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 this is all the most recent data on the state. Okay. So. Our reimbursement right now is 8314 We do have a state grant, and I spent a lot of time lobbying for that money, so this is, um, right now, I'll tell you how much we have in total, but right now your grant is $815,000 that comes to your community uh, to contribute towards the medical students, the staffing, the transportation, the education of our students. Also, for those of you that know a little bit about state funding, or the state of Massachusetts, so there's something called Chapter 70, which means that the state must give every single public school a certain amount of money for every student that's enrolled in a public school in the state of Massachusetts. And, uh, and the per pupil reimbursement is based on your town's wealth. So right now, your town receives $3,000 from the state um, Department of Education for every single student in Reading. And because medical students are enrolled in your community and they're, full, they're fully um, members of your community, you get that reimbursement for our 101 students. So that would be another $300,000 coming in directly to the district 
-hmm. not to the MECO program, to the district with whatever mm -hmm. your total amount is, Chapter 78. But I wanted you to see, because sometimes we don't see this, yeah. that there's additional funds coming in just to go to the administration of the schools for whatever the school needs to do with it. And that right now, so, you're, so if you really look at this, your total contribution um, by having MECO students there is $1,120,000. And also a lot of it had to do with Curtis's advocacy, because when, when he started last year, he had 70 or 60. Um, when I first 60. started, it was 47, and then we Shut increased up. it to <laughs> well, I just know that last year we gave we gave you guys like a bigger yeah, grant because yeah. he purposely asked for how many? Wasn't it 40? 40, yeah. 40. So that last year was the biggest increase in the MECO program in all of our towns. That Reading was the one that got the highest um, add-ons. We actually hadn't done that ever um, since the 70s. So we gave people, you know, the districts an opportunity to like to say how many students they wanted to add and then we went out and then we found the money. So that happened because Curtis identified that, and now he's at a decent size because he was, I know it's not a lot, but That's trust me, years. that was less than 50 the other day. So you know, that it's taken decades to get our numbers to go up. So so yes, I see hands here. Go ahead, she can go first. Um, as a former MECO student myself of Belmont, um, that's nice to see, but what is going to be even more impressive is filling positions in these districts with people that look like the students mm -hmm. to mirror what they're seeing because I'm sick and tired of seeing <clears throat> being the only person in the building. Um, I did it all through school. I'm now an educator out there or an assistant educator. I advocate for a student group. I'm tired of being the only one. I'm tired of being it's the okay. black voice in the room everywhere I go. I feel like we, if we're putting our students out there, we need to encourage these districts Correct. to do the same. And, we, and by doing that, like putting some kind of stipulations on things, I know it sounds kind of cruel, but it needs to happen. Mm -hmm. People need to be accountable to our students like they are accountable to the students that live in their district. Mm -hmm. That is um, one of our like, goals right now is diversifying the teaching Like course. Reggie, I used to live in Boston. I now live in Reading, mm -hmm. um, but I, I sit on a lot of boards because I feel like if I don't, who's going to do it? There's right. only a handful of us, as you can see. There's only a, what, 5%? Mm -hmm. of us. Not even 2% oh, of us, mm -hmm. right? So, and a lot of other people aren't willing to speak up because they're afraid of the repercussions. Um, my mother, thank God for her, because I used to be that person that didn't speak up and I don't know what happened somewhere along the way. I just stopped, happened. stopped doing that. Um, so yeah, I think we need student. to hold districts accountable to staffing. Um, and that was a big thing I said in a lot of my um, meetings, even with the town itself. Like at the, at, <clears throat> we recently got um, a, um, what is the town? A town manager um, of sure. color. We finally got a, two police officers of color. Mm -hmm. Um, and we finally got a health director of color. Prior to that, the whole town was all white. Um, there was no official positions in, within the town that was held by anyone except someone of white background. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need to kind of encourage that because yeah. that's our children's role model too. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree 100%. Your mom has something to say. Can I have to take your mom real quick? <laughs> I'm just curious. So, do most of these kids start in kindergarten and grow up through the Reading School? Because when I was in Reading, that's exactly what happened. Was we did not get an influx beyond what originally had started from the Metco program in the school, and the students came up from kindergarten all the way through high school with us so that like they were really integrated into the age group the grades and you know we grew up with you know that combination right and there was very very few added along the way to the Metco program at different grades yeah. so is that different now because I remember when Jada was in elementary school that there was not I don't believe there were any Met Co students, students in, in Joshua Eaton, at least in her grade. Well, because I mean, you're talking about those low numbers, you're not going to see it in every single first grade, you know, because you're spreading maybe a handful of students in many schools, but yet the majority of our students do start in kindergarten, 
as a whole that I'm talking about already. As a whole, the majority of applications that we take in and that we refer out to the district are in kindergarten, but the program is not a kindergarten program. We accept at all grades because we're a space availability program. So wherever there is, and I explain to you, the, I'll explain it to you guys next right here, and we'll answer a little bit of that question. So although that is where the majority is, there's some districts that do not take in any other grade but kindergarten, by choice, not by requirement, because they want them to be there longer than usual. But I was at the Wayland graduation this week for the MECO program, and there was a lot of tears on that graduation because it was a kid that started in, 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 um, in high school. And the district never, ever, ever took a kid in high school in his whole history. But the director that was there was a Meco alum, like Meco alum, all these Meco alums everywhere. And he advocated for starting to take in, in, um, in, um, in high school. Because when he was a Meco student, he started in high school in the ninth grade. And when people think he wasn't going to make it, he's not has his PhD, he's a doctor. So, you know, he talked to the superintendent and they allowed it. And then the kid, the first kid they accepted in ninth grade graduated this past week. And he won every scholarship, all the awards, <laughs> great college. Everybody was talking about him, super student leader. So he like, you know, the superintendent was like, thank God you know, this worked out. I'm so glad you just opened up the door. But no, we do not take only in kindergarten. We are a space availability program and it's called a marginal <coughs> seat program. Marginal seat program means that we are not gonna make you open up a new school or, or, or hire a new teacher um, because of the MECO program. So, you know, as you know, if you live there and you guys run out of space, your school and your district is mandated to find, to create a solution. We don't make you do that. Like we look, literally look at sections across all of your schools and we look and see, you know, even if a school is a little bit crowded, you'll be surprised we still put a MECO student there because if it's overcrowded as a whole, but in that one fourth grade classroom, there's 19 students instead of 20, then that's a slot right there. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a win-win situation for everybody because you know the district gets a grant, it gets diverse staff through the medical program, it pays for the transportation, you get diversity, and then your seats do not remain empty. So it's like a win-win situation for everybody, the medical program. Okay, so. Um, right now, our grant is $29 million for the whole entire MECO program, and that gets divided between 33 communities. Springfield gets a little tiny bit, but I still don't know who they are. I gotta, get, I gotta make that happen this summer. That. But they get from the same money, and then we get money here to run this office. And that is how the MECO program is run. And we are under the Racial Imbalance Act of Massachusetts, which is the, um, basically says that it's illegal, illegal in Massachusetts not to integrate public schools, and the MECO program is the only program in the entire state that fulfills the law. Nobody else is doing that. I think I need to probably stop, because I am still at the <coughs> beginning, and I want to honor you guys' time. Um, so, yeah, it's too much to talk about, because this was an engaging conversation, which I love, but I, I don't think I, I want to be fair to you guys' time. Um, I have another question, yes. then. <laughs> So do you at all like still work with parents and like within kind of the like host communities and kind of create like maybe like a host family dynamic where students have like a place to go because I know a lot of students who like want to play sports and like be engaged within the community especially yeah. at a young age where it's not necessarily one for the school. Kind so of this is friends of Me this is friends of Mecco. That's what their job is, uh, mm -hmm. kind of. Like that's one of the goals, sort of, you know. But I mean, that is what the Mecco, the Friends of Mecco, was started in many years ago with that purpose. Again, everybody runs differently. There is no rules for Mecco anywhere that tells you how to run your school district, how to hire, what support systems to put in place. It doesn't exist. Okay, the state gives you guys the money on a bed per pupil. The leadership decides how to best use it. Then the parents organize if they care enough about this and they organize friends of MECO groups, they, um, they organize family friends, um, and then, so it's two things. I, I don't like to call it host families on purpose because that used to be the old name, but it still is in some communities, but I don't like the way host because then you feel like you're always visiting. 
I like to call it family friends. And to me, family friends means just that. Like, okay, do you have a friend in the community that you can stay with? But that has to really be grassroots led. It has to be led by, you know, you can't make us a school, us a school community tell people to have a friend, right? It has to be something intentional. There are some of our communities that do that. They have a staff person as a family coordinator. They intentionally create opportunities in all, wherever there's Meco students to like have outings and go to picnic and roller skating to see if friendships can form and then ask families to sign up to, you know, to, to, um, to, uh, not host, to another word for host, but to be friends and have them stay over and, and do all those great things. But that is, has to be grassroots, grassroots led at this moment because you can't make people be friends and open somebody's door. But that's called family friends right now. And the other one is called Friends of Mecco. The Friends of Mecco program in most communities, that again, I can't talk about you guys because I don't know it yet, but the Friends of Mecco in most communities are fundraising groups. And they actually do, they do run the marathon, they do, they do um, celebrations, they do um, dinners, and then that money is used to do other things such as scholarships, late buses, um, engagement activities. I'll run from the kitchen to to the thing, but it's about it. Cheryl has already saying she's not going to run the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll that, that's I'm not running. Listen, that's in Wellesley. Wellesley runs deep with their friends of Michael. They raise like thousands and thousands and thousands well, well, of we'll dollars. Well, we'll be broke then. And they do a lot of like scholarship there for college, and they do a lot of the late busing, but they actually, you know, it's, it's what you have in the community. Somebody that had access to the marathon numbers, and they dedicated it and, 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 and gave it to Michael. You know? Yes. I don't, did you have a question earlier? No. Okay. I was going to say I am hiking. I am doing a hike to raise money for Friends of Reading Metco, but it's not a run, and I might pass around. I might pass around the hat in a minute. <laughs> so, very slow. Very slow. Yeah. So one. So um, appreciate. You know, we're running along, which is great. Uh, but we're not going to get to the whole presentation. It sounds like. So could yep. you share this with us? I can. So that we can include it in our packet and. I can definitely do that, but you said, and I'll be willing also to just read, because um, literally I'm in the first three slides. I have to <laughs> so I'm saying I'm willing to do something virtual for you guys and pick whatever guys' days you want and invite as many people as you can because I can give you the slide deck, but you need someone like me behind that. <laughs> I, mean, I need to be able to have like, you know, to have the passion behind it, the explanation behind it. So I'm, you know, I love to do this virtually. There's not a problem. You can buy a wider range. We'll do the whole entire thing. We'll stop and do Q and A in between. So maybe we can host something in the pack or something. Friends oh, excuse me. Can, yeah. can um, students of color and allies host you? To do a presentation. Yeah. Did we do that? Yes, you did. My group, is, my group is sick that day. <laughs> oh, I, well, I, I, I am, I am not wanted up here. <laughs> just, just, just one, one other question. So you mentioned your researcher who's looking at all this yes. uh, data from over time. It sounds like it's intended to measure sort of the impact of the, of the MECO, you know, the MECO program. Um, is the researcher going to be able to look at anything town to town and tease out best practices, right? So what you said to me, what you said just a minute ago really struck me, that there aren't rules and there aren't, you know, sort of guidelines and every town sort of figures it out. I wonder, I wonder if there's a way to use that research to help town say, like, these are the towns that have been most successful and here are some of the practices that... So she, so because she's that an economics professor, she's going to give, like, real data as it relates to numbers, not as it relates to qualitative data, but I, so, but for example, she'll let us know which town has a higher percentage of medical students scoring higher, she has access to who's taking AP classes, who's in honors, she has access to what kind of colleges they're going to. I mean, it's crazy the data that this girl has. Um, so it, it's like amazing. We're going to be able to see a lot of pictures that we'll be able to tease it out by communities and let yeah. communities know this is where your where your medical students population is looking at in comparison to other people mm -hmm. in your district. So yes, that will be common. But in addition to best practices, though, we are in the middle of an anti-racism um, anti-racism 2.0 um, implementation where every district is going to be talking about its best practices practices with our consultant. So we have we hired a researcher from Washington who was actually doing this whole project for us, and we will have this book at the, in the fall that will tell you exactly the best practice for Friends of Mecco, for fundraising groups, for AP courses, for diversity in hiring that has like a, a clear track where they're doing that. Like Natick, they have like a purposeful strategic plan for that, and they are documented that. So like. There's, you know, there's there's very specific things that are happening, and we're gonna put it all in one place so we can learn from it and everybody will be able to see that. So we'll have that qualitative best practices of Meco, and then she'll have the data of performance. 
and she's also looking at the, at the suburban data as well. So she's part of her study because of some of the opposition that we were having in some towns when you have a couple of haters saying some things publicly, some of them were saying that we were bringing down the performance of white students by having students of color there. So she actually researched all of that already and that's already done. And she looked at all of the towns where there was Mexico in comparison to where there's not. And there was absolutely no impact to white student performance as a result of having a Mexico student there. If anything, what it's doing is closing the achievement gap for students of color. They have higher college aspirations. They're actually, their SAT scores and their, um, their MCAT scores are higher than Boston Public Schools. You know, so there is better preparation happening academically. Yes, Jada. One of the things that um, I specifically just kind of want to focus on because um, to me it was on my um, committee who was speaking to this earlier in the year when we had a meeting with Mr. Wise is it's not, there is a academic gap, but it's the extracurriculars that are just kind of like the complete non-starter of like where things just completely break down with like accessibility. But it also has, I don't know what, what your situation is with, with late busing, that has a lot to do with it. Again, I have all of these districts in my head because I meet with them frequently. Like for example, in Linfield, there was no participation from any of our medical students in absolutely anything after school. And then when they intentionally started working with the superintendent and the medical director there, got on the same page, we had a new superintendent there that was like really about equity, saying this is not gonna happen anymore, this is done. She had a late bus, 100% participation in after school activity mm -hmm. by every single medical student. Mm -hmm. So intentional approaches, right? People gotta go look at the gaps. I have another district where it was required for students to go to um, sports practice on Saturday, required or you couldn't play. Mm -hmm. Our students couldn't get to practice, so they couldn't play. So what happened, the parents organized, the students organized, I was actually physically there helping them work out through all of these inequities, and now they have a Saturday bus that comes to Blue Hill Avenue where we single Saturday to pick them up, and now, I mean, so you see, sometimes it's not that people are doing, things bad because they want to. I honestly feel that everything, I hope that you guys feel this way too, like nobody here is shaming any things that are, that are going wrong. If we cannot have these honest conversations and authentically just talk about it freely, look at everybody going, we're not gonna change. I can tell you how many things when I was a parent in Brooklyn of oversight that they had over and over and over again. My daughter was asked to defend slavery on, on a paper. She was crying at home because she couldn't do the paper. You know, so they had to go to walk to school for Green Day. We couldn't walk to school couldn't get our hat, you know? The Hispanic Heritage Month was never celebrated all my years. I walk in and my culture's not anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I'm saying this to you, you know why? Because all of that changed, because I spoke up. And I was not a CEO back then. It was, it was a simple, no, but it was not even a bad fight. I was like, superintendent, do you know that if this, is, this is happening? Oh, could I get flags in every single school? Can you talk? And it, this is a funny story, I told him, Everybody got to eat, right, at your school every single day, right? He's like, yeah. So why can't during Hispanic Heritage Month we have a meal every single week dedicated to a Latin American country? I have talked to their food services director, and then the food changed. And since then, at every single school in Brookline, there is a celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month every single year since that happened. And everybody texts me, remember, Lily, I'm eating this right now. Thank you. But that was like, you know, and then when I talk about the bus thing that, that they couldn't watch to school, they made the bus stop at a particular corner, like where the train was. And then every person from Brooklyn that wanted to walk to school had to meet there easy fix, and guess what, and right now they just used the MECO grant to revamp that, that social studies curriculum. They paid over $100,000 to revamp the entire curriculum for the entire <coughs> district because of that one incident that, that happened. So I'm just telling you that, you know, things happen when people hear each other and be like, you know, because sometimes it's just a blind spot. It's not on purpose. People don't know what they don't know. People don't know what they don't experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love about the Mexico that when I can give you this tour, this is why I like literally cry when I do this because all of these things happen because a, a parent spoke up and nobody made anybody do any of this work. It was just the parents that wanted better, the system to be better, and then the school committee chair right here, Leon Trilling, which I love school committees like to death. You guys don't even know how much I love what you guys do because the power that you hold is beyond what you could even imagine. He heard Ruth Batson, our founder, talk about years 
of nobody in Boston wanting to integrate schools in different books and different science projects and, and, and improve her school system. And he heard her. He said, Ruth, come. Come to my school committee meeting. I got empty seats. I don't want my kids to grow up with no diversity. They're losing out. And you want a great education, I have it. You got diversity that I want, you have it. Let's go. It's so one friggin' meeting, guys. And then they took that conversation to six other communities nearby. And in less than six months, the MECO program started. And now, 57 years later, here, here we are. 57? 57. <laughs> 57. Over 10,000 alumni. I also think, like, there is Hispanic Heritage Month. There is Black History Month. But I feel like a lot of people are saying they only feel celebrated then. Like yeah. they that's are true too. It's a yeah. start, but that's true too. It has to be all of the time. Mm -hmm. It has to be all the time. Like it's not even about celebration. That was just an example. It should be the curriculum should be representative of our cultures. That's one thing that I complained about too. Because my daughter came home one day and told me, "Are you sure that you're Latina, mommy?" I'm like, "Really? Um, why would you say that to me?" Because. Dominican Republic is not mentioned in any of my books in Spanish mm -hmm. for all the years that I've been here. Uh, what countries are mentioned? Please tell me. Spain, Spain and Mexico. 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 See, it never fails. Everybody always knows. So I talked to the teacher and I said, can we, can we just do something else? Then everybody got a different Latin American country. They all got to research it. They all got to present it. Now we're looking at the curriculum. You see, but you're right. It's not just that. It has to be what, 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 what she said as, as well. It got to be like, are we hiring diverse staff? Is our curriculum representative to our walls? And when we walk into the building, have different people. But you know, it's a start. I'm not shaming anybody for progress. This is why I'm calling this the roadmap. All I want is for people to do something. Just don't do nothing. Do something. And if you don't do any, if you do something, I'm gonna be happy with you. If you don't, I'm gonna be like, mm, maybe you shouldn't be part of my book. So, for example, next year will be the first time um, in all the years that they've been doing school educational trips that we will be taking a Black History tour mm -hmm. to Atlanta, and we'll be going to Birmingham mm -hmm. and Montgomery. So, I keep encouraging families to sign up. Mm -hmm. So I will be hosting another meeting on June 7th mm -hmm. for any parents. It's open to all high school students, even the incoming freshmen. So, so I say leave my part because I really need to leave it for your sake. Okay? <laughs> um, I want to just thank Tom and thank um, Curtis for their leadership, seriously. Because, like, again, the MECO program was less than 50 the other day. It is now 100. It was barely a MECO staff there, now they're staff at all of the schools. He just took everybody, um, a, a good group of students to a black college fund, um, HBC, I'm sorry, that's my other partnership, trying to get, yeah, HBCU tour. And the, the thing that I loved about what you did, Curtis, that you brought guidance counter with you. Because mm. sometimes they don't even recommend an HBCU, that's not even an option. They don't know about it. That was like super, like, like we use that as a best practice. Like if we don't educate our educators who are supporting our students and giving them options on what's available there for students of color, they're never gonna say, because again, it's a blind spot. You know, so there's a lot of things that are that are happening um, already with this new leadership. Because trust me, a few years back, you guys were sincere. You guys were a mess. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I was gonna say I was worried. I was about to call the state and say and say the medical program gotta go. Before this new leadership came, it was bad. Racial incidents everywhere, complaints everywhere, everybody leaving, the entire administration changing left and right. <clears throat> I, mean, I don't know which many of you lived this, but I was from a distance being like, let me see, if something doesn't happen mm -hmm. here, like I began to have conversations. And be like, I've lived guys, it. we gotta I watch. I've lived it, my daughter was in school there, from sixth mm -hmm. grade, and she's now 28, I've lived it. But now I'm hopeful, now I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, I'm happy. <coughs> I'm gonna have to add, there are still many racial issues. Oh no, there is, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, listen. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't leave that to be yeah. unsaid right yeah. now. And I just, yep. Yeah, but that's 100%. I'm not denying that. And I actually, and I want to be very clear about that. I'm saying that I'm expecting progress and people working towards it. But by fighting racism is no joke. Okay? What you need is commitment from people that actually want to do something about it. But there's no medical town that you can choose right now, 100%, that I don't have a complaint right now on my desk waiting on racism. There's none. Hmm. None. Okay, because this is the world. I always say we're not gonna, we're not gonna be racism. But can we go to places where the leadership cares, where the leadership is trying to do something? 
I wish that I can tell you that I, you can pick a, a community that was flawless, but it's not, trust me, I live it in one of the most progressive communities that you can imagine in the MECO program. It just, that's not gonna, it's not gonna happen, but when something happens, how are you being treated? How is it being handled? How, you know, how are you speaking up? What are changes happening after that? Is there a commitment to this work? That is what we can expect. But I think it all stems from the education piece. We are all learning, so it's a learning progress. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if we're not educating ourselves and educating others, then we'll, we're going to have to repeat yeah. the, right. the history. That's why this grassroots is so important, mm -hmm. guys. Like if you guys, all of these groups that you guys are doing and what the school committee and leadership is doing, like if you guys can all just continue to push ahead and not give up, I, I'm working this whole 2.0 thing. I got three words that I'm working on is three eyes. Remain inspired to do this work. Be intentional about how you approach it and insist that change can happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's my three eyes for the last couple of years. That's what's keeping me going. All right, guys, I'm going to sit down. Okay. <laughs> It was really engaging. Really. It was really engaging. I really appreciated that. Um, and we will, I think we'll take you up on your offer to find some more forums to, yeah. to go through it in more detail. And That's the grassroots We'll give right you more there. of the agenda next year, I promise. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I shouldn't promise. I won't be chair, probably. But, you know, <laughs> somebody will hopefully give you more time next year. Um, okay. Um, Mr. We're going to transition to Curtis uh, for an, uh, an update on um, our own program. I think I know some people had to go about how their friends were at a Mecca go first. But yeah, we could take and that way, and then I'll just kind of go through just so everybody can. Why don't we do this, Carla? Why don't we just take a motion? We'll take E three and E four out of order, and then um, is that okay if we take C back as well, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I move. I move to take. I don't want anyone to leave. I move to take E three and E four out of order. Is there a second? Second. Second by Chuck. Uh, not debatable. All in favor. Opposed. Okay, great. Um, so let's go to Friends of Reading Metco then. Thank you. Oh, I don't know. Thanks to all Jada's questions, I think most of our presentation. <laughs> 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 but, you know, you know, oh, know. Thank God. Uh, oh. Just speak, just speak up so the camera picks you up. Yeah, sure. There's, There's a camera. Stand up. There's a camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take well, the space, Sharilla. Take the space. Stand up. We can see you. Take the space. We are Friends of Reading Metco. Um, the, some of my board members are here. I'm Cheryl Lillestrade. Um, I've been a MECO parent of Reading since 2006. Shh, that doesn't tell me age. Um, my son is the current MECO um, representative there for me. Um, I started um, on this board, or on this group, uh, over a decade ago, gosh. Um, and I am the sole survivor of the original group, and then I met these lovely people who joined, and now in, officially we became a nonprofit in 2022, and our goal is we do know that there is racism, and we know that the only way that that is going to change um, is by knowing each other. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so this is why we're here. We want to let families know that we are here and our mission is to build relationships with Boston and Reading families and the communities so that we can build authentic relationships. Yeah, and just to add a little bit to that, we do both host our own events um, and um, also partner with um, Curtis uh, and the Metco department on um, partnering with them on events they're doing. Um, and as Sharla said, that we, you know, our driving goal here is to build relationship and trust and a knowing of one another. And when I had said kind of before to your question, because uh, the Metco department really oversees the found families, which I think is the name for our, our program, and we kind of support the uh, the concept events. around that, right? So it's like we are doing events and we do fundraising of our own to support those events. 
um, but the formal program lies under the MECO program. Um, and we're really just trying to build those bridges and, and have those relationships and enrich all of our lives, but um, mostly the students' lives and student outcomes. And also to share information that some of our Boston families don't have access to because they're not part of the outside Reading community. So maybe something that is going on in Reading or the fact that um, because the Boston student goes to Reading um, that they also have access to the community sports um, groups as well. So like Pop Warner football or um, something going on at the YMCA, the summer programs, and that's what we try to encourage the growth of. Um, I know from my, my daughter's experience in the program, it was a horrifying one and she just wanted to go to school and go home and that was it. Um, my son started in kindergarten so he built those relationships, and I can tell you that there were times when I couldn't make it to him, and I, they, the families that hosted him, kept him, fed him, God helped them, because he was a eater then, and he didn't get it out. <laughs> but um, they, um, they were my lifeline. They, we grew such bonds that we even had like adult sleepovers. And, oh, wow. And we would go <laughs> out. We'd, we'd, we'd all go out and so forth. So, um, and even when one of their children even left Reading Public Schools and went to private schools, she refused to let me take her name off the emergency contact list. So, um, this is the types of relationships that can only be built through engagement and events and activities and being able to share space um, so we host events both in Boston and Reading we alternate and we hope to be able to continue that but also to add to our board and our group mm -hmm. yeah I think that's Levanta's oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. see I started talking y'all shouldn't have let me go first <laughs> we shouldn't have <laughs> um, so I'm LaVonda Epps, i um, been a METCO parent for, how old is my daughter? I was pregnant when she started, so seven years. Um, she'll be seven. And I am, this is, what, this is why this was my talking point, I am the sole um, Boston parent for METCO. And we are looking to recruit more um, Boston parents mm -hmm. so that I can stop saying sole. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I see a head nodding over there. <laughs> um, Boston parent. I had always, I'm, I'm gonna share this piece, I had always wanted to be part of um, this board even before we added all the lovely people that are here now. And side note, this, this right now, this would probably be my found family, like if my, my child or children needed to be someplace, these would be the only people right now that, hey, I can't get out to, to Reading, can, can you go pick up one of my, my little people? Um, these are the connections that I've, I've built and I feel comfortable with. But I'd always wanted to be part of it, um, but I couldn't fully do it until last year because my little one had finally become of age to be part of the Metco system. Um, so I couldn't be out in Reading and then in Boston because she was only in daycare. It, 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 like I'm only one person. I'm, I'm a single mom and I'm just yeah. doing it by myself. I have three, but. My oldest is, yeah, 24. <laughs> um, and she's moving to Houston tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, nice. oh. But um, um, it, it's, it was really hard. So now that they're both in one place, it's easier for me. So I understand that you know it, it's a hardship for a lot of parents when their children are split up. If you can only just volunteer for like that one event, you're still building a connection. So um, don't, don't feel bad just doing that one event. Come, come on. Thank you. We welcome you. We welcome you. Um, but we, we we do like to increase the the participation and enrollment. Sign me up, I mean. Woo yeah. Tiffany yes. did. <laughs> Tiffany. From, from um, Boston parents, yeah. mm -hmm. and I think it actually it'll it'll help and increase because when you're at the bus stops too, mm -hmm. like that's where you build connections. Yeah. Like when I'm I'm that mom at the bus stop, I'm like that's not the car you rode in this morning. Like, that, that's not your mom. That's not, and I've done it to her. I've called back like, um, so and so's parents not here. Like they're standing there. 
where, where are you going? Right. Where, where's their where where's their mayor? Where's their aunt? Where's their whoever? Yeah. So it builds a relationship for also for me and whoever is going to be up from Boston that you know that relationship. Okay. Um, and like I said, we do partner with Curtis. We do have five events that we like to plan. Four to five. I'm I i do not know about the fifth one, but we do four to five events um, on our own, and we do one just just for parents, just because. We do a lot with these kids, yeah. and it, hey, I'm, I'm one that I'm, 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 that's why I didn't bring them tonight. I, I needed a breather. <laughs> but we do a lot, so it lets you get a chance to let your hair down, um, speak, and I've met some wonderful yes, people. Thank you, I loved it. <laughs> um, outside of just our community. Um, what was I gonna say? I left my brain. No, well, bring it back. It, it, it gives an opportunity for trust to build because I know I grew up in a Caribbean household and my parents weren't letting me go anywhere unless they knew the people um, and there was some I knew they knew who was living in your house and who was visiting um, so it gives that opportunity but um, what we'd like to get back to as well is not only including some Boston families but also some educators and admin because they used to be part of this board um, and it's also a good thing too because eventually not right now but um, because it's also important to build those relationships with them outside of their job because we all know that we're not our job we are all individual human beings outside of our jobs so that was a really great part of them being part of the original board and so hopefully I just wanted to quickly add, um, I'm Teresa by the way, because I know I, I skipped that, um, but that our board meets once a month, so it's not a huge time commitment in that way. We really divvy up the, the work, um, and there, there are one hour meetings once a month, and we do have lots of volunteers, like Tish and others who are volunteering for events, so I want to acknowledge that, and we would love some Boston families on the board. Yeah. Let me know where to well, you got your find number. me. I got your right. number. Okay. <laughs> you got my number. So hopefully lots of folks will watch this video once it's up on YouTube and whatnot. Um, if they want to get involved, what's the best way for them to find you? Uh, we have our website. It's do we have very so We can send our okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. A giving page as well. Yes. So we can help. <laughs> we'll say that louder. Giving page. <laughs> I just want to introduce a couple of our other members of the board. Yes. Yeah. We have Ilka in Hello. the corner. <laughs> we have Reginald right here to our left. Yeah, and, uh, and one of the things I did, I, did, I forgot to not only do my, uh, myself, my wonderful spouse, Hi, Janetta. Um, <laughs> hi, London, and my, my daughter who's, um, who's in seventh grade at, 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 at Parker. Sherla? And, 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 and me. Yep. I did. I thought, oh, because I Reggie started talking. That's fine. We have two members who couldn't make it. Yes. Uh, Alyssa Scott Alyssa, Scott Alyssa and Allison. Really hard. Um, well, thank you all very much for, for uh, coming and sharing that with us. Um, Sean, can, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I just say that I, I forgot to just give credit to Sarah, our assistant superintendent, as well, when I was talking about the new leadership. She's been instrumental. Um, also supporting the medical program and working directly with Curtis on that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that too, um, Sarah. Thank you for all your support. I know that you've been instrumental for all of the changes and the support that you've given to Curtis. So I had to say that. Okay, so we also have um, a few members of the CPAC board here Ooh. to just provide a brief overview of, of uh, CPAC's work as well. Yay! Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, so I'm Maria Morgan, I'm one of the board members, and Zia is a new board member, and we're just so excited to have her. <laughs> and I want, I want her to speak the most, but I, I was just thinking about how you talked about the power of connection, and it, it sort of frustrated me at one point, because I'm like, it, it sort of came down to like, Ilka had coffee with one of our board members, and like, that's how we ended up with Zia, and I'm like, why did it have to like, that? But I guess that's how things work, you know? So like, that's fine, you know, it's good. And um, we're just so thrilled um, to have Zia. So uh, you share, you, you do what you want to say. You say what you want to say. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
Um, I was actually <laughs> excited to join with, how do you say your name? Is it Yorka? Because I say Yorka. It's, it's the Australian thing. It's, I say il it's Ilka. Okay, Ilka. I've been calling Yorka, but Ilka called me, well, she sent me an email um, back in 21, and we connected. And then I met these two ladies at, what is it, the Women's Friends of Reading? like meetings, mm -hmm. like we had little parent meetups, we did cake decorating classes, we did a paint night and things like that, you know, so I've kind of built little connections along my way. Um, my daughter joined MECO in 2020, she was in second grade. We went through an uphill, kind of like rough patch with just trying to reach out for services because I knew something was going on. She knew something was going on. There was no connection between the two of us as far as what we could figure out, we couldn't figure it out. Long story short, my daughter is dyslexic. Um, we didn't find out until the end of 2020 school year, her first year in MECO, thanks to Reddy's, thanks to Killa. Ms. Gramley and her second grade teacher, she reached out to me, she said to me, she said, um, mom to mom, I'm gonna speak to you, I think something's going on with your daughter. I said, yeah, I know, I said I requested an evaluation at the beginning of school year, but that kind of fell through. Not anything to do with Reading, but it fell through. Um, but we got it done within 30 days at the end of school year, second grade, and they found out she was dyslexic since then. She's now in fourth grade. She is reading at a third grade level right now. So they have caught her up on my recognition from any letter, any number. They caught her up in the last two and a half years. And she's working very hard, so I'm proud of her for that. So my goal is just to reach out to more Austin parents and let them know that you know you do have a voice in the kids also. You know, I make sure my daughter knows she has a voice. Um, you do have a voice if you can't speak up. Someone will listen, maybe not right away, but someone will eventually listen to you. And you do have that support of these wonderful people in this room. You know, so it is, it's a big deal because you kind of feel lost sometimes. You feel like, especially being a minority, and I come from like a good immigrant family, it's difficult. My family's very ignorant, I will say, to just recognizing things like IEPs or any sort of disabilities, like no, you just do what you gotta do, do your work, you know, work hard, you're not working hard enough, but I don't reckon, I don't look at it like that. Mm -hmm. I support my daughter in whatever it is that she needs help in, and I will advocate for her at all costs. Like, we have tried psychiatry, we've tried parent child interaction therapy, we've tried, um, we did three evaluations, two through BMC and one through her school prior to kill. They all said developmentally she's fine. This was a second grade child who did not know how to read anything. How was she developmentally fine? I don't know. <laughs> but Killam saved my life because all those years I kind of went into deep depression because I was fighting for my kid and it's like no one was listening to me. You know, so it was really tough on me being a single parent, but she now has services that have helped her so much and I'm so grateful to everything and everyone who has helped her along the way. And even if it's just me, I will fight for you <laughs> and I will listen to you and make sure it gets to someone who will listen to you and take you on seriously. See, good job, writing. Somebody figured this yeah. out and the kid's doing better. Yes. 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 Good job, Mom. Good job, yes. Mom, really. She's yeah. lucky to have you. you. We got to chat over pizza and you're lucky to have her, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. So CPAC is you know for all all parents, um, and it, it's overwhelming. And um, you know, as a parent who lives in Reading, it's overwhelming. You know, as a white parent who lives in Reading, it's overwhelming. So I, I can only imagine the additional layers. And we're just so grateful to have Zia as part of it. You know, we talk about we need all the voices at the table, and um, I'm just so thrilled. And I, um, you know, parents that I know from town, like they get to the point where they're frustrated, and then they come to me, and it just is so. Don't be, it doesn't need to be like that, you know. Um, and I feel like our leaders in town, like they want to listen, they want to hear. And you know, uh oh, and we have a website. We have a new website. It's um, mm -hmm. if I can just look it up. It, there's a ton of information on it. Look at your age. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Cpac. dot reading. dot k twelve. dot ma. dot us. Um, I just look at those stickers. <laughs> <laughs> I know when we were going to be at the kite festival and I got canceled. And it was so sad. And she got crayons and it was so nice. Oh. So, oh. So we'll do it next year, but um, yeah. So please, you like we want we want all parents to feel 
like key members of their teams with their voices amplified. And if anybody doesn't feel that way, that's not how it should be. And we just want to do whatever we can to support. And I feel like we have the leaders that will listen. So um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, thank you. What does that stand for? C C oh, thank you. I know. Yeah, CPAC, it stands for Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Um, so, like, 504s and IEPs, especially, but also anybody kind of wondering about, like, does my child need extra supports? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I forgot to add one, well, two things. We have a save the date. Um, since there are a couple of people here for August 19th for our back-to-school event. Um, this year, it will be held in Reading, though, so that we can keep with the back and forth. Last year it was held in Boston, well, Dedham location, but this year it will be in Reading for August 19th. We will be sending out um, an email regarding it, but I want you to say the date to Saturday. And the other piece, really quickly, about the events when we're trying to partner, um, Cheryl touched on it really quickly, but um, I stay connected with the events. Um, there was a daddy-daughter dance out in Reading. My daughter, um, she attended with her godfather. Boston, yeah, right, I was just about know, to say, no one knew, and we were the only Metco family out there. I, you know I would have been there. We, we were the only, it's, so it, it's, it's not through the schools. Right, no, it's so not, that's, like, that's why we talk about the, the know, community connections that and they wouldn't have known. Don't get. I'll tell you, they didn't do a very good job of advertising it in Reading either. There were lots of Reading families. <laughs> but no, but it was, it was packed. Tour, but yeah, it, oh, no, no, it I know. It was yeah. packed, because it's probably packed with the annual people who've known about this for years, because they both are similar. Yeah. And, and I ended up and you guys live. I didn't get to bring my daddy either. Yeah, you guys lived there, and I attended. My my daughter attended. We had wonderful pictures. It was she had a, a ball. I mean, I didn't stay inside too long because when I looked, I was, legit was the only mom in there. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go. But um, like you could have attended because your kids attend school out in Reading. My son's doing swimming lessons out at the Burbank YMCA every Saturday um, for free because he is a Coolidge student. So these are all the things that I find out, networking, um, looking at the Reading sites, because my child, children, go to school out there. Easter egg hunting, um, we did out in Reading. I don't limit it to, to staying in Boston because my kids are part of that community and they're like, hey, that's my friend, we go to school, hey! And it gives them a chance to see their classmates. Yeah. Because they don't have all of their friends out in Boston because they go to school out in Reading. So it's like, well, I got to bring you to where your friends are. Because by the time they get home, they, you're not going outside with anybody from your neighborhood. I think that's what was helpful for my son, too. Because like he started playing Pop Warner football and never saw friends in Boston because everything was out there. So he was already acclimated out there. His friends were out there. He didn't want to do anything. So now he's football, wrestling, he did chorus, theater, band, everything was yeah. track. track. Every, yeah. Am I missing anything? Oh, oh yes, and Minus he does AWOD and, and student, whatever that other one is. Box office. Yeah, yeah. Box every, office. Everything. And he's yeah. also the co-president co of the Student of Color and Allies um, group that I advise. So, your students have voices too, so especially if you have a high school student right now, tell them to look into it. I know they, they want to come when we serve, when we're doing food events. <laughs> they should come when we're not doing food events. Um, and like tomorrow, I'll be hosting the second um, Caribbean culture cooking class. So um, we should do more, I think, more with things like that for the students to be encouraged. I know this year, um, last year I had talked to the former um, lunch manager or food manager and then she left about doing just what Millie had said she did with her district um, and then she moved on and got promoted to a very awesome job in nutrition and health care for the state of Massachusetts. How do you ever? Um, but the woman that came into her place was willing to work with Curtis and this year we had um, an awesome lunch for Black History Month and everybody's talking about it and the kids we hosted, the students of color hosted, 
a um what did you guys have? So it was, it was um, a uh, multi-culture brunch uh, in the middle of the day. We had donations from people. We cooked some stuff. Uh, we got donations. Uh, they had a yeah. wide variety yeah. of different foods, cultures different, different cultures. And it was awesome because at first they were afraid that no one was going to come down. And even down to the saltfish and bakes, we, we ran out of there was nothing left. I know. <laughs> I know you guys don't know what that is. As Caribbean people, we're like, wait. <laughs> and that's why we need to get together, right? We don't know the saltfish. We had so Irish soda like, bread. We had so Portuguese good. dishes. We had a Dominican flum. We had um, Caribbean saltfish and bakes. We had pastelitos. So it was just really nice. Um, we had some Asian dumplings. We, it was nice to see that the kids were able to share their cultures and then even some of the teachers donated things from their cultures which was really awesome because what we never even got the opportunity to hand out was a packet that we had made with information like a little Q&A of um, what different cultures were represented so people could learn a little bit about but it was Awesome just to have people downstairs conversating about what's that, where is it from? Um, and I think, I don't care what anybody says, food always brings people. Yeah. Yeah. Especially free food. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I've been talking to Mr. Wise about is like kind of access to resources because there are a ton of things through Reading, through the state that are just right there that we don't know about. Like the library has like free online language courses access to the New York Times and the Boston Globe and Herald, and nobody knows about it. And that's kind of one of the things that like could be so easily given by the district, the teachers, just like in a packet at the beginning of the year, just here, here's your parent resource packet. And it just it hasn't been done yet. So I think that could be a very important thing for every single parent of a Reddick student to help. Or students themselves. I mean, teachers giving you something, if you miss a class, here's the video at the beginning of the year of like, this is that unit, like broken down. All right, Curtis, we've been looking at your, covers, your cover page for about 15 minutes here. I'm going to hand it to you at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna fly through this. Um, you know, the Celtics started a. Celtics are up. I checked it out. Don't shout out. Thank you, Jeremiah. I did have a video I wanted to share, but I'm definitely gonna. Like, this, uh, we can post it or something? Uh, we can post it, yeah, we'll have to put it back in. It's like, all right, yeah, really. Right, 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 take, right. take your time. Uh, we're not gonna, we don't need to fly through, but we will put, put it in the packet for sure. Gotcha. All right, so, we're, you know, we're at the end of year two, and you know, we've done a lot, and um, it's, it's flown, flown by so fast. And last year, when I was coming into this row, I really had three questions. Um, why was our enrollment too low? Why was there no staff? And why was there no late buses? Um, those are my three main questions. Just off the bat, coming from being an alum, the district where I was at from, being in this role now as a director, being monthly with all the directors, I've come to realize that not all medical districts are created equal. Um, as I spoke to the school committee in my first, um, from my first um, speaking time, speaking to you all, you know, I was I told you about my drive and just to be the best and wanted to be the best, wanted to be the model district. Um, so that's where I went, uh, where I was going. And last year we, we talked about putting in some media changes, which was adding the late buses. Um, and then it was, you know, when I started, we were at. So when I started in June 2021, we was at 47 students. By October, our max that we could be, which was from our previous year, was 67, so we was able to get there. And then we did the expansion last year, uh, which for the 40 new students, we came short of the 40 students. And these are our numbers as of November 2022, but we were at uh, 103 students. Um, so going from 47 to 103, that actually put us in the top 10 uh, for enrollment sizes in our, in our um, for Mecca in the state, and you can see to the right, we were, you know, new and that's 414 students, going all the way where we come in at 9, at 103, Lincoln Sudbury, which is a crazy number to me, I just had to add it because that's just the high school, and just the high school has 91 
this time. Oh, wow. uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I had to throw that up there just because that was outstanding to me. So that was just kind of our big focus. Um, now the students are here and we're working on how to make sure that we can receive and be able to accept and, and, and service our students that are here and working out those um, different procedures and policies. Um, so that's a, that's a little quick spiel on our enrollment. Am I supposed to point? Um, you don't point, yeah. you just hit the arrow whichever okay. direction is right, I don't know. So then Click left to right. Okay. <laughs> so the next step was adding coordinators. Again, it, it was hard that we didn't have coordinators, but you know, bringing them in, um, it, the impact that the coordinators have had to all of our students um, in the building has been amazing. Um, we, I took down, I won't read everything, but I'll show you one of the quotes that we had from a parent. It said, Jackson loves Mr. Brown and talks about him all the time. Um, as a parent, it gives me flashback to when I was a student hanging out in the medical office with my medical coordinator. Um, I love the mentorship my son is getting from a black male student in his school. Uh, I am a huge fan of the medical coordinator role, and that's from Naomi Brown Jones, who was a parent from Ian. Uh, so again, we just had great impact. Um, our, our coordinator as a director, most, most growing up, I didn't really see my directors. Um, it was just my coordinators. And um, having, I understand why now, right? Because they had coordinators and you need someone in your building every single day uh, that just students can go to, um, that all students can go to and benefit from the medical program. I'm also proud to say that the reason we, we had no staff ever other than the director in the history of writing. In this school year, we had six coordinators, so six students, um, six adults working in the building of color, and we were able to do that because, you know, the district and the Mecca grant came together, and that allowed us to bring more staff. And I'm proud that other districts are calling us to figure out how we got so many staff so fast and taking on that model um, themselves. Um, you know, with the help of Joseph Longbottom, myself, some coordinators and principals. Uh, you know, the coordinator role is a big role. There's a lot of responsibilities. It's a dual role as a school adjustment counselor. But for the MECO um, side of it, we wanted just to kind of focus on five things for next year. And that was one, the MECO coordinators working one-on-one -on -one and individually, um, and, well, individually in a groups with Boston resident students over social emotional needs and academics and whatever's going on in life. Um, the second one would be doing the same with building the connections between the Boston resident students and, and um, Reading resident students. Um, the third would then be focusing that with the parents and bringing families together. Um, and then we want our coordinators again to be as part of the building leadership team um, working with um, the school. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see that. But yeah, working on the leadership, being on the leadership team, modeling culture responsive leadership. So that means when we do have Hispanic Heritage Month, um, it's not the responsibility of the only person of color to do this work, but they will champion it, bring this type of stuff to the table to make sure as a building um, that we're doing something during each culturally heritage, each cultural heritage month that we have throughout our school calendar. Um, and then just working with staff and thinking about things like how do our Boston students get to this event? How do we change this event to be a different time so that all parents can get, can get to it? Um, so that's what helped by sitting on the, on the leadership team. And then assistant teachers and principals with you know the communication with Boston families, helping the liaison, help building trust for our Boston families with the schools when stuff like special ed, where as a black family, a Caribbean family, you don't really trust um, the special ed process, and the coordinators help build that connection. And I'm glad to hear that you will see Pat because that's another avenue that we can um, help bring that trust and um, with our families and coordinators. Oh, wait, Curtis, I'm sorry. Uh, before you switch um, the top one, <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned something about, sorry, you went kind of fast, um, school adjustment counselor. So the medical coordinator is the school adjustment counselor for the entire school? Yes, medical coordinator slash school adjustment counselor. So they're and not just for the medical They're not just students. for, they're working with every student in the building. Um, to be more specific for the, it's a, for the school adjustment part is working with um, just the general population of students who have anxiety and stuff like that, whatever issues are going on in the building. Um, they work on that aspect, and then when it comes to medical, doing the culturally um, 
events and different things that's going on, they're working with students and doing that well. So it's a great dual world role that makes sure that every student in the Brennan Public School is participating and gaining something from the micro program. And I did, in Russia, I did miss a part. Uh, we were able to hire a, a new staff member, so we will have seven um, coordinators next year. Uh, we were able to hire Jerico Santiago, who will be the new coordinator split between Coolidge and Parker, and we're moving the role of the middle school coordinator now to the high school, so that the high school can have full time someone. And our goal is still to get one more, because that only gives us seven and we have eight schools, so our goal is to get one more coordinator sometime, sometime down the future, down the line, so that we can have someone in the building full time um, at each building. What does that leave the MECO coordinator, like, do they have enough are they stretched thin? Because if you hire them to be METCO coordinator, mm -hmm. and they're supposed to be for the METCO students, why isn't there a separate school adjustment counselor to, to address the issues for the, the entire school as a, as, a, as a whole? Great, great question. So a couple things. The, um, prior to last year, the elementary school did not have uh, school counselors. So school, all of school adjustment, school counselors. adjustment counselors. So all of the burden fell, prime, fell entirely on our school psychologists. So our school type psychologists took on a little bit of a different role than maybe they do in other communities. So all of our schools did have school psychologists. So now adding in this, Kitlam had one for, for two years ago. A school, a school adjustment counselor and a school psychologist. Um, that was, I, I don't mean to, was that because the therapeutic program? Right. We have attached the therapeutic program. Yeah. 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 So that counselor had now shifted the barriers of the therapeutic program. So, um, so there hadn't been school counselors in our school. So this now, the, the role is a dual role, is paid half out of our district operating budget and half out of the METCO budget. So that's where that dual piece comes in. And I would share, you're exactly right. Like right now we ask to, you know, our, our counselors, you know, How's the what's the workload like? I think they're working with the psychologist to try to balance some of the student needs, but it's not enough, right? And I think if you ask our, our, our teachers, they'll say, we need three more counselors in our, in our school. So I think um, it's a step, but it's certainly not an acknowledgement that we think that we have enough social and emotional support with just the needs of students that we're seeing. Um, and I agree, like ideally, it would be great to be able to parse out those roles, I think that we, that was a challenge sort of budgetarily with the idea of us being able to fund that on the operating budget or the METCO budget. And I also think the other challenge is I think we wanted to make these roles work with everyone in the building too. So I think that was part of the intent. I also think that that's also kind of important. I mean, when you're talking about the dual role of METCO is like putting Boston resident families in the schools, but also the host community is kind of like accepting in diversity, like getting white children to meet with black adults and learn to trust them. I think that's kind of an important part of the process. <laughs> but it's important to track that, like how are we making sure that the METCO, or you know, Boston resident kids are having adequate support. Thank you. Especially if it's one, if we I can I, I can see where you're going with that, but if we have one person in a building that. that is doing a whole school, especially mm -hmm. given after COVID, I think that's a lot excessive on one person, and I think that we should have started it off with let's start small and go big and go big, instead of go big and then be like holy cow now we need to dial back a little bit regroup revamp and now let's work it through. That's just my personal take. Um, I'm, I'm happy to finally see more staff, yeah. but it's one person in a building of how many? Well, I don't think I heard Curtis say we were dialing back. I thought he just oh, said no, no, no. I didn't, so, no, I didn't say- So that's actually pulling more people right, to I didn't say. I didn't say that we were dialing back as far oh. as adding people, but I'm saying like now you have to, you have someone, one person who's taking on a whole role, just like Curtis was taking on a whole district. We just need more people. Right, and that's what I'm saying. So like before expanding the job to cover the whole school, we should have had them working with individual students for now and then slowly expanding so that we could first get to know ours before we get to know the whole community. Personal take. I do, and one challenge that we had, I think it's a good perspective, we definitely thought about that, 
Um, and I think one challenge we had too is the, is the funding with the, we wanted to fund, we, we had to figure out a way to fund the role out of both the operating budget and the Metco budget. So we had to figure out, and I, and I hear you that these are roles right now, our psychologists and our school counselors are stretched really, really thin. Um, so I certainly hear you, I think that's a good point. Um, well, I just wanna, at, at the very least, though, commend you guys for that leap, because either way for me, um, going from zero to seven, we gotta take the wins. And also, I think what you said, Jada, was a very important point, because in a lot of school districts, it's a best practice, they're looking at these shared roles, so that they have the responsibility of integration, and they don't leave the other kids behind. If you know you're being paid out of the MECO grant and out of the district grant, you better not let those other, you know, Michael, you even not let our Michael kids fall through the cracks because you're getting paid for that. So I think, you know, and then the fact that they're looking at how to integrate culture and cultural responsive leadership in their communities and celebrating culture and diversity and bringing our kids together and not, you know, there's something to be said too about both needing affinity spaces but also needing integrated spaces, you know? Um, so I think, you know, there's school districts that are doing this shared role. And, um, and, and it, but guys, you gotta, you gotta admit, from zero to seven, that's still. <laughs> oh, my, he you know? didn't show my comment. My comment's up there. I'm, I'm appreciative so, of the fact that we have, like, we, we added the, the medical and, and this diverse and staff, staff, I'm assuming, kind of, maybe? What I don't know. Staff? Is yeah, that yeah, all, yes. They're all students, they're, they're, they're all staff of color. color. Yeah, they are. I mean, you know, so that accomplished a lot of things, you know, and mm -hmm. also the fact that they want to do more. But with that micro grant of 800, how much is your micro grant? It was like 800, yeah. about 800. Yeah. You can't, I'm telling you, I see everybody's budget and I see everybody's school district. And to have seven people work in the micro program with late busing and micro director, seven coordinators, at eight hundred thousand dollars is almost an impossibility. So the district had to take on half of that cost, which is also very commendable. So yes, could we then have that plan to just say, okay, if we look back at this data and we say it wasn't working, it was overwhelming, how do we add other things? How do we add social workers, social work interns, if you have licensed people that you hire? There's so many models that we have to start looking because everybody's rich thin. Even the richest and the most like fully staffed district don't even have the support that they need. You know, so I'm just saying that I hear you, but I think this, I, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. And I think we just look at it and see if it more is needed. How do we then tackle that, you know, later? And how do we create it? A lot of people are hiring licensed social workers so they can take interns on to then have smaller groups and all that. I mean, I'm a licensed social worker, so I'm always like, always pushing people. Like, don't forget, if you hire an LICSW or an LLC, they can get college students that are taking in their masters and they'll be in your buildings for three times a day so we got to get creative about like the mm -hmm. life like the kinds mm -hmm. of people that we hire but i don't you know i just don't want to lose sight that that's still a that's still something that's going to be in our book of best practices how do we share the role so that our kids don't get left behind because you think i only work for the district no you work for both remember i remind people all the time remember who's paying you with this medical grant so if you're not advocating for this that's your salary mm -hmm. i also think like as a Reading resident student who went through the elementary schools, the middle schools, and now the high school, as a student of color, if you had told me that there was a METCA coordinator, I wouldn't think I, I was, gone. yeah. yeah. Gone, like I wouldn't feel that it was like it was for me. Yeah. And yeah, it, there I, were no teachers of color. I, I, as far as I know, there were no teachers of color in the elementary school or the middle school that I went to. No. I mean, the first one thing was besides the metro director. So it just like it would have meant something to me having a black teacher within my school, and to like kind of have that closed off as like a door that you like can't go through. It it's not yeah, because it, like it, having it deepens the separation. Like that's for them, not for me. You know. Yeah. And could that lead to like a sour grapes thing? Oh, well, I can't be there, so therefore I don't like the phone, I don't like, right. you know, right. things I mean, like it's that. a trial. I love to see how it, work, how it goes, because, you know, we're all looking mm -hmm. at different ways to do this. Like, someone told me yesterday, I forgot what meeting I was at, that, like, there's many ways to skin the cat. I don't, somebody told me that the other, yesterday. I'm like, you know, sometimes you might have to try it this way or that way. Maybe it works shared, maybe it's separate, maybe it's with other, 
you know, interns with other funding, but you know, we have all kinds of different ways to approach how we service our students because it still is a funding thing at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to share one thing while we're here too. It's all, I just want to thank the five coordinators and guys who stepped in this year. I think they've done an amazing job in coming in a new role and building relationships. And I think, I know LaVonna said her quote was up there. We've had a lot of student quotes who just say the impact of this educator on me has been tremendous. A lot of times see themselves in, in another adult, someone who shares a racial identity, but someone to connect with them, someone to care for them has, has made such a huge impact on a lot of our students. And that's as a result of the five educators, and five counselors plus the coordinator who have really done an amazing job stepping in. So I just think we, in this conversation, we were missed to not just shout them out individually because they have done an amazing job with our students this year. Um, and we're seeing that impact, so. I, I can speak to my white son who is um, enamored with the coordinator at Coolidge Middle School and loves him and they, they interact and he has benefited as well on that, you know, Reading resident side. So just two other quick things. I mean, one, one is uh, we can always, there's not an area in our district where we couldn't use more, where we right. wouldn't be better off with more people right. in those mm -hmm. roles, right? Like there's not, any role that I would say like it's, you know, it would be wasteful for us to add somebody in that role, this is no exception for sure. I think one thing that was important in approaching it this way was wanting to have somebody dedicated to each school to really get to know the kids versus being split across mm -hmm. schools, right? I mean, we, you know, we do that with some of our specialists, for instance, that they split across schools, and it, it, it's just, it's difficult, you know, it's difficult for students to connect as much when those teachers are, you know, those teachers, those staff members are only in the building half as often and can only come to the after school events every other time and th that sort of thing. So having that dedication to the school as we allocated sort of you know, how to create those roles I think was one of the was one of the priorities as well that landed us in this, in this um, sort of combined approach. Also quick question about numbers about how many students are in each of these schools that are metro roughly roughly for elementary the lowest is like test our goal is to be um, not ten stu a minimum of ten students. I'm, I'm sorry, eight students at each elementary school. Okay. Right, so we have five elementary schools. We have one school bus, forty kids max on the school bus. That's kind of safe. Well. So about per eight students right per school. So I, I just want to bring, sorry, Curtis, yeah, yeah. I just want to bring that perspective in because there's no way you would have been able to hire. Oh, a full-time person yeah. at a school with not yeah. even 10 students just right. for Metco. That just wouldn't even fly anywhere. That, right. that cost per student, it will be too much. Right, 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 right. So I think that's the only way to really approach it when it's at that level. And you have a school where you got like 40 students or at a high school that has, then you're gonna need a dedicated person, right? right, right, right. But I mean, in but this case- But we don't have one at the high school. Huh? But we don't have one. Right, but we're working towards that, you know? I mean, that's the goal. Yeah, you can't do it all, you can't do it all right away. Yeah. 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 Next year's already been approved. Yep. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. We're, we're, you know, we're adding. Yeah, we just need one more, one more, and then we got eight. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so the next slide was our HBCU tour, and I kind of did a reflection, just, just a few pictures, and I put together a quick little 10 minute video that I wanted to show. Um, so I'm just gonna skip through real quick, just so we can watch the video. Uh, but some of the highlights from this year, uh, we'll speak on the Zaz Black History Month. Um, that's where a local Boston restaurant came over, completely took over the cafeteria, and served school lunch. The goal is to continue to do that. So we've spoken to Alex Chimis, Piccolo, already in the works for uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, and to continue to do those different things with different cultural events um, throughout the school year. Um, but not only to have this at the high school, the goal is to do something at each school. Uh, so something at an elementary building, something at a middle school building. We had a middle school student talk about the importance of vegetarian um, food and menu on the on the on the um, cafeteria menu. We spoke spoke with Vegan Oasis at Four Corners, who we almost brought in this year to do lunch for the Parker Middle School and Village Middle School. But these are just some different type of cultural things that we're trying to do. Um, highlight was the apple picking, which was kind of like our first like kind of found family event. Uh, another highlight was the race class that we had in this year. We had a lot of good conversations. Uh, we had a quiet group, but it was a group that felt comfortable that they can actually speak up and say their say what they're thinking um, without judging each other. Um, they were able to accept each other's opinions and have some really good deep conversations. Uh, that was a really good 
good year, um, um, good semester, I'm sorry, um, we were able to do that. Um, the MDA conference was another great turnout for us. We were the biggest district turnout um, over the year. We would always have like a handful of students, but by far we had the largest turnout. Um, the middle school students, um, um, I'm sorry, middle school students have been attending, especially new students have been att attending and participating in pretty much all school events from school dances um, to field days coming up. Uh, the middle school boys took part in our follow suit program, which is actually took place across the street at B2 uh, Boston um, Police Station, where they learned how to make their own suit and make their own custom suit, but use the suit as a mantra to be a good person, to be a good leader, to make vision boards, um, and to be learn how to be a good young man. Uh, the middle school students also took part of the Empowered Prime, which is an eight-week program that focused on self-belonging, team building, mental health awareness, and self-esteem. Um, Advocacy Day was another big, good, big, good, big day for us. We had high school students, we had elementary students. Um, elementary students was able to read some letters, which I would try to share um, here. Um, one of the letters that one of the students uh, read to one of my senators. You know, we have a bunch of teachers doing great things in all of our buildings, but one of the shout outs, which is something that I want to see, we would like to see more, uh, is the killer, Allie Horton, is a music teacher. You know, she was really teaching our students jazz and the history of jazz and blues and hip hop and reggae and rock bands and Tokyo rock bands. Uh, really just bringing music and our extracurriculars to, to, to be more culturally uh, fit for our students and learning. That's that. The senior shout out is Alvin Day. Alvin Day has been here since kindergarten. Mm -hmm. He is graduating, um, going to a post grad school where he is pursuing football and has a few scholarships lined up. Uh, Bianca Ferguson also has been here since kindergarten. We had this cake where we celebrated them in the office. Uh, Bianca is going to Framingham State and will only do one year because she wants to go to Clark Atlanta next year after the college tour. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, some of our focus for next year uh, will be found families, uh, really trying to really build that up. Um, and you know, a lot of stuff has happened naturally, but really put a focus on trying to build that up. Um, try to build a sense of belonging for our students of color to make sure that when they come to school, they all feel welcome that this is their part of their community. I can't read that one, it's too much. <laughs> and, um, we want to build more school field trips in Boston, um, getting our kids and you know, our Boston families being able to do stuff in Boston and our Reading students being able to be exposed to the city um, and some of the great things going on in the city. Um, we have the rolling out of the new high school coordinator next year. We're looking to be more culture responsive with professional development opportunities for staff. Uh, we're looking to increase our academic support for our Boston students who, who need support. A lot of our students have doing, been doing ACLU tutoring in Boston have really been beneficial for them. Uh, we definitely want to, uh, I got up there, that's the bus monitor. We're looking for a strong bus monitor for next year for our elementary bus, something that's going to be consistent. <laughs> uh, that's been a struggle for us. Rock yeah. Um, we're, looking, we're also taking a look at shortening the after school bus route in Reading in the afternoons for our elementary bus. Going to pick up the five schools mm -hmm. has been very challenging uh, and, and causing huge delays. Um, so we're taking a look at how we shorten that. Uh, which will make the, the ride even shorter for the kids. And then increasing our partnership with Friends of Red and Mecca, which would also strengthen our found family. Um, that's another focus area for next school year. And then this was another video. I'm not sure if we're gonna get to it, but it was only seven minutes long. Um, but this is just a picture from um, our family. I think it's a mix of everybody really from different schools um, at the apple picking event. So do we have time to show the reflections of the high school students a few? I mean, technically there's no time limit. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we well, certainly can. We have we have two very short orders of business after right. this. So you know, we can, if, we'll people need, if people need to step out, obviously you're welcome to do so. But we'll post it. We'll post it. Yeah. Right. I gotta get up. Yeah. 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 Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Sorry. So we're going to post it? We're going to post it. Yeah, we're going to post it. All right. Great. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions for Curtis before we move on on accomplishments this year, plans for next year?
great in the last two years to see all of that. It's just very impressive. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So just yeah. impressive. Yeah. Um, our last two orders of business, we just have one vote, uh, which is a final vote on the 2023-2024 budget and capital plan. Carla, if we can start with a motion. I move to approve the final FY24 operating capital budget for Reading Public Schools as appropriated by the annual town meeting in April of 2020. Is there a second? Second. Second. Let me check. Um, any discussion? I, um, I mean, Dr. Milchewski, I don't know if you have anything you want to say. This hasn't changed from what we right. included in our in our committee recommended budget, so I don't think there's a whole lot to to discuss. But we've talked about it a lot. We've talked about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Many many, many <laughs> meetings to get to this budget. Yep. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with that, we'll move to the vote. Um, I don't think we need roll call. I don't think we need roll call. All in favor? All opposed? And it carries four to zero. Okay. And then final order of business is just um, I just wanted to sort of introduce the process and timeline for the superintendent evaluation, uh, the summative uh, year-end evaluation. This is, it's gonna work virtually identically to how it worked last year. Um, in the packet is uh, a memo which includes just a refresher of the goals and benchmarks. Uh, many of the benchmarks we've already you know, reviewed and received this year, um, but it also includes the focus indicators and a description of the focus indicators that we chose um, back in September, probably. Um, we, we landed on nine. I had to go back and rewatch the video because I didn't believe that it was actually nine, but it was nine. Um, so we landed on nine focus indicators. Just as a reminder, um, and the rubric uh, and the form that you fill out is in the, in the links that I included in the memo as well. Um, just as a reminder, the only uh, indicators you should rate um, are the, the nine focus indicators, and your sort of roll-up ratings should also be based off of you know, performance against those, those indicators. You're welcome to write commentary about other things, right? And we know that you know Dr. Melchesky is ultimately responsible for all of it, um, but those are the ones that will will pivot the uh, the actual evaluation and the rating around. Um, from a timeline perspective, um, Dr. Melchesky uh, is going to start. I'll let you speak in a, in a minute about evidence piece, but Dr. Melchesky will provide us with um, a link to a Google Drive. Um, I think it's going to be a Google Drive with with the evidence pieces. I'm asking committee members to submit um, their, their draft evaluations to Dr. Milicheski, um and Olivia no later than June 11th, which I think is two weeks from Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the sort of preliminary meetings with Dr. Milicheski to review the drafts will happen that following that week, the week of June 12th through 16th. Um, by the end of that week, so by the Friday, I need uh, any revisions which should be submitted to Dr. Milicheski, Olivia, and myself. I'll take that weekend to create the consensus evaluation, and then on June 22nd, which is um, two meetings from now, we will review the consensus evaluation and take a vote to approve it. Did we get the evidence you said already? Yeah. Oh, you're going to say it's yep. coming. That's yep. the day so, right. Yeah. I can, I'll turn that around tomorrow to share a link, and you should have all that. Yeah, so everybody will have two full weeks um, with the evidence in hand. And again, I mean, a lot of, you know, Dr. Milchewski is obviously going to, going to provide the evidence. Much of this has been a frequent topic of conversation throughout the year, so um, folks can probably get started on some of these if they want to, but the evidence will come very shortly as well. Uh, so that'll be the process. The, um, the rating form is, is linked in one of those documents, the rubric that gives you more detail about the focus indicators. It also lays out, if you recall, um, what... Um, meeting the standard and, and surpassing the standard and all those sorts of things, what they look like against each of the focus indicators. So all, all that you need to um, make those ratings in a consistent way is, is captured in one of those two documents. So any questions on that? Okay. That brings us to the end of our, our agenda. Is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> Seconded by Chuck. All in favor? And we are adjourned.